when you think on all those hours and hours of running, what's this purpose of life? That's such a critical thing because literally it's like your why statement. For example, with my A races, like I actually write out a why statement, which is unique. I don't know a lot of people who do that. And I don't do that with all my races, only like four races, maybe a year. And it's like finding that why is, is so critical. And it's what I'm trying to do with my students as well. They're at this exciting crossroads where there's so many different directions they can take life. And it's like finding their why or purpose is like the number one thing that can really ignite your fire. I've been excited about sitting down with Harvey Lewis for, for the past couple weeks. And um, I think you're inspirational, not because of the guy I've known yet that hopefully I'm going to get to know today, selfishly, but you've done things that a lot of us think are close to impossible, unattainable. How in the world could somebody run hundreds of miles without stopping? Um, but there's a few other unique things. So you had an awesome 2021, right? Yeah, yeah. It was uh, quite, quite, a, quite a dream. You had some wins. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, to be honest, 2022 has been right up there as well. So that's what I'm wondering. Yeah, okay. And, and I'll know 2023, we're not slowing out. <laughs> <laughs> so it, we, we keep on that, going with that momentum. So you're 2021. So to talk about, so you're an ultra marathon runner. You are a public school educator. You've been the star of a documentary, right? Like Harvey, like Son. Yes, yeah. It's inspiring. Yes. Thank you. Um, and so that was actually, that documentary was about trying to break the time record for running the Appalachia. Is it Appalachia, Appalachian? What well, is it? Oh, man, you can make up. A, I, I say things wrong all the time, according to my, my fiance. So, <laughs> Yeah, I think it, you you can say it whatever way you want. You're going to be a good oh, company yeah. today with that's me. Good. This yeah, is that's nice. Good. No, that's great. I think that's pretty good. I love hearing it different ways. Um, and so, 2160 miles or 2106. Uh, you know what? It, it w what's interesting is it actually changes slightly every year, um, based on like what's happening. I mean, because uh, it's across uh, 13 states, so it's somewhere around there. It's somewhere in that 21. 2200 uh range and uh it's it's uh it, it's an area of the country that I, I thought i had an idea of but when i went in and went across the whole uh, distance i was just absolutely amazed and surprised by sights in each and every state i came through the um you know coming into every podcast i try to do some research but i don't want to do too much because i'm going to find out who the person is beyond what we can find online, right? But something else that's really important to you is a plant-based diet. Very important to you, right? Yeah, yeah I'd love to talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've been uh, vegetarian uh, since 1996 and uh, vegan uh, since uh, 2016. And for me personally, uh, I, I've, I've, I went that direction. My mom had a stroke back in 95. She was only 54. She was a nurse. And, and it just uh, really was something that sh shook me and, and like, uh, caused me to change up my paradigm of thinking because I really thought I, was, I grew up in, uh, I was born in West Virginia. I, I lived in the Appalachian, or not Appalachian, the Allegheny Mountains of Pennsylvania. I lived in uh, Cleveland. And uh, growing up, I think I was only exposed to one vegetarian in my whole <laughs> life experience. So, uh, yeah, so that, that was something that, that, that really uh, has, I, I, arguably, I'd say it's, it's, it's the main reason I'm able to do the things I'm doing now at 46, where I'm not slowing down. I don't feel injured. Uh, my knees are amazing. Like, I feel like I'm, uh, you know, is stronger than any other point in my life. And a lot of it has to do with what we eat in this country. Um, so it's something that, it's funny, and that's the stories that we get into a lot and through conversations. 
It's the origin, mm. right? And so there's a couple fascinating things about Harvey that today I'm excited about figuring out and digging into, which I think connects with this entrepreneurial spirit. And um, the amount of time that you were running ultra marathon. So an ultra marathon, correct me if I'm wrong, because you're an expert, it's anything beyond a traditional marathon distance. That's right. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, which is at tw- is it 26 point two two yeah right thirteen point right. one's a half right, right. so so twenty six point two um but what I want I don't even know if you know when you hit twenty six miles though because when you came in today you ran and I said man did you run here like how perfect and you're like yeah man <laughs> it was just a little it was just a little jog through the woods and um, but anything longer than a traditional marathon distance and. The amount of time and the amount of races that you had to run before you won one. Talk about that. Well, it, it was a long time. <laughs> but because growing up, uh, you know, I, I just was actually not... Uh, I went through a phase where I was built more like Chunk from Goonies. And uh, I just really... I enjoyed eating and I would eat a lot and I, I, w- I would eat like when I would go to maybe like Taco Bell, I mean, they thought that I was having a part, we were having a party and it was just my mom ordering for me alone. <laughs> and this was like in middle school going up. Uh, so yeah, it, it it's, it's kind of shocking to me in a sense that like I never won a race or I've never even came close to winning a race when I was in middle school or high school and I ran track. I was always situated more towards the middle of the back. And then it, it took me a long time of running ultras, actually. I, I don't, I think I didn't win my first race until uh, 2004, the same summer I broke my neck. And it was a small race uh, of two miles on the beach with like 13 people. You were the 14th. <laughs> so, right. But isn't that where a lot of victories start? They start small. It starts small. And, and it's just, being uh persistent persevering just the gradual trying to work on your craft whatever that is and wherever you are i mean whatever the whatever it is you're working in i mean whatever mode in in uh passion you have if you make it something that you are willing to give a a a uh almost obsessive amount of energy to it's hard to stop that and it's hard to stop some amount of growth and it's been kind of wild seeing things develop across the years do you remember the first moment in your life maybe it was eating all that taco bell (laughs) but do you do you remember the time you're like i'm gonna win this when did it start like the 18 taco soft tacos in the bag oh man but but like when did that happen so i think did you run your first marathon at 15 I ran my first marathon at 15 and I was far from like, I was near the very back of the marathon. And when I, yeah, at that age in life, I just didn't think it was possible to, to win the race. Like I just didn't think I had the, the, um, genetics to win the race. So why'd you start? Can I like, why'd you, why'd you run the first one then? Right. Uh, well, I just, well, I ran the marathon just to run the marathon. Like, cause I, I did it for the challenge of finishing it. And like, for me, it was a victory just to finish the race, even if I was the last person. So it didn't matter if I finished, you know, wherever that was finishing the race was a big deal. It was like graduating high school or finishing a degree. It meant a lot to me didn't matter where i where i was in it Mm -hmm. where'd that come from that feeling so you you obviously felt did you feel that when you started the first marathon said if i finish that's my victory well yeah it was it was definitely like uh something that was it was uh a a challenge i like kind of threw out there because i i spontaneously came up with this idea of doing this marathon about eight days before the race so the furthest i'd even run was actually eight miles and my mom was fortunately very much, I was able to like persuade her into doing most things. <laughs> and and uh, she's like, okay, yeah. So she agreed to me signing me up for this race. And I told all her kids in my track team, I'm like, I'm going to run this marathon and I'm going to run at eight minute pace. And they're like, oh, 
no way. There's like Harvey, you, there is no way you're going to finish this race. So the, the, it was like a binary option, either win, like finishing was total victory, not finishing was total failure. So like just to finish and, and show our like guys on my track team, like that it was possible and I could do it or to myself or anything else out there, like that, that was something really uh, kind of neat. And, and I think you know, it has like a, a, an important message or, or theme behind this is, you know, a lot of times we don't do something because we're afraid we're not going to be able to do it. So that's a huge thing, whether it's an entrepreneur, you know, starting a business, whether it's, uh, you know, right anything you yeah, dream man. of, yeah. like it's, it's such a big deal. So many times we get stopped because the number one thing is just taking the step and doing, you know, no matter what happens, like if you, if you don't like take that initial step, you, you can't nowhere nothing happens and then everything so. starts stacking from there yeah so that eight minute without doing a bunch of calculations is that that sub four hour oh yeah i never hit, i is? did not hit that yeah i got to about mile i think i hit about mile nine maybe mile 10 and i thought oh my god what what did i get myself <laughs> into here yeah and, and then it was just like oh, fortunately i found a couple other people that were feeling that were looking like folks. zombies and yeah so we we managed to like walk and run and i mean it seemed like i was crossing like the sahara desert and i mean it just seemed like the most uh like uh excruciatingly uh tough like uh physical like exhausting thing you could ever dream of but uh once i finished i actually put that out of my mind it's like i that's one thing I don't really talk about, like the the things that might be negative that you feel. Like I actually totally put those out of my mind now. You so remove it, them. It, it mostly. So it, it's it's hard for me to even like talk about something and like present it present it in its level of difficulty of like how much it might Cause feel because it, it doesn't matter. Because I just focus on like the positive aspects of like. I mean, even I think a lot of people have that experience that like do running events, whether it's like. A uh, short race or a marathon or ultra, they, we we tend to like uh, kind of black out the you know anything that was discomfort in the race, and two weeks later we're ready to sign up for another one. Is that um, so? That's an attribute and a characteristic that should be looked up to by so many of us, and, and here's why: because you set your mind to it, and you say, "Hey, this goal that I'm signing up for." regardless of the cost i'm going to accomplish it doesn't matter how much time how much pain what the commitment what the loss i'm going to accomplish it and if you set your mind that hard and that stern and focused on that outcome you don't have to worry about the pain mm. and i think so often what we try to do um this it's what i love about that applies across so many aspects i'm sure in teaching I'm sure the kids that you're trying to get to believe in themselves a little bit more and show them what's possible in life, but it's the same belief that you have to have in yourself on a 300-mile race. I think you have to say, because if you think about it, correct me if I'm wrong, I'd like to understand this. There's multiple moments in probably a 100-mile race, a 300-mile race, that if quitting's an option, you're going to. Yeah, I mean, it, it is true. I mean, you really have to, like, uh, make your mind – I mean, a lot of people do quit races. You know, it's like – but for me personally, I've gotten to a point where it's uh, – I don't leave that as an option. Like, it's not I, – I had – uh, well, okay, if I go back to 2010, I did a race called the Spartathlon. It's a really amazing experience. It's, it's one like of the top a, ten in the world. It's a cultural endeavor. It, you run the – following the original route of Pheidippides – from Athens to Sparta and it's uh, 200 or 153 miles and it goes uh, across uh, a nice set of mountains over uh, about mile 100 and it's where like the legend has it that uh, Phidippides had this vision with the god Pan and he gave him some special uh, message that he brought back and helped them to beat the Persians but uh, in that Covering that that mountain range and uh, in that race that when I was there in 2010, I I ended up uh, getting to mile 116 and just 
feeling totally zapped and I thought it was impossible to finish. So I, I quit the race at mile 116. And after the race, I reflected on it and I, and I was really kind of disappointed with myself, not, not in a sort of way like beating myself up over it, but I just didn't want to do that ever again because I, I realized that I actually had the, the force within me to still finish that race. Like it wasn't the way I would have wanted to finish it. I would have had to like pretty much walk the whole rest of the race and struggle at like, uh, uh, like just like give it an absolute struggle just to barely possibly finish that race. But I gave up without trying. Like I, I thought in my mind, I, I decided I made a mental decision in my mind that it was not possible to finish that race. And I wasn't even gonna try. Even though like a lot of things happen once you give it and you keep going, some things can happen. You get some more calories into your body. You get rehydrated with some electrolytes. You uh, stretch a little bit. You, you just keep on walking. And a lot of times your energy will go to a low and it starts to build back up again. And I really didn't let myself have that experience. So after that race, it really impacted me. And since that time, I've only had a DNF, do, did not finish in um, a couple races, uh, which are types of races that, that it's a last person standing. So it's like only, the only person that, that actually doesn't get a DNF is the person who is the very last finisher with like last year when I got, won the world championship with 354 miles in 85 hours of running. So uh, that, t that race, and then also Barkley this year. Yeah. So the Barkley is like, uh, it's, a, it's a mean beast of a race. It's the, the hardest race in the world, and that could be a whole other topic we can talk so, about. But, so, so quitting made you stronger? Quitting made me stronger. And, you know, all those races where I finished – and I was towards the back, like all those were impressive. Uh, they definitely formed the ground for where I am today. So, I mean, I actually didn't win my first ultra until 2010. I won a hundred mile race in Ontario, Canada. And like it set the record there. Uh, but that was, it took me, 14 years of running ultras before I won my first ultra. That's a long time. I mean, the Bengals, they, they have, <laughs> they, they, they imagine going 14 years. I think, we did. <laughs> I think we did. I think we did. Oh, no. Um, so what kept you going on those 14 years? Because well, I bet there was – because I think you might be – is there anybody in this category of a 100-100 man or a 100-100 woman? Oh, yeah, there's marathon. people that have run 100-mile 100, uh, 100 races. So, and there's so, about 17 or 18 of them now. So here's what I'm talking about. I want yeah. to put a new thing on Harvey, a new goal. You have these high – let's see if you have right. this goal. Like, a, the, You're probably not the first person, but to accomplish 100 marathons and 100 ultra marathons. Yeah, no, no. There is actually – That's a category. Uh, 18 people have done 100, 100. 100 100-mile races. Yeah, they've done 100, 100-mile okay. races. Okay. And uh, I'm actually getting really close. I'm at, and no, not close to 100, 100 miles. I will do that in my lifetime. Okay. But I'm at like 92 ultras, and I've got somewhere close to about 90 marathons as well. So it, it, that, that is coming up for me, but I'm not the first in that. Okay. Yeah. Is that something like what's talked about? What are the um, you know North Stars? in marathoners ultra marathoners other than like winning the world championship yeah or if there was somebody in marathons winning the new york city marathon i'm sure that's a thing um what's the big things is it the combination uh, yeah. i what mean it? that's kind of a, a neat thing of our sport is we actually have uh many specializations so like we have the hottest races we have the mountainous races we have the backyards uh like we said you have uh just really fast 50k races and 50 mile races so they're they really our sport is really subdivided over lots of different areas and like we talked about the appalachian trail like that's another domain where you're going for a fastest known time but uh for me personally like the this last year i, I ranked as number five uh the fifth highest ultra runner in the country uh of ultra running magazine and that that was that's pretty neat because that was the first time I made the top ten list, 
and it was on my let's see i think it's uh i've been running ultras for 25 years so it's 25 <laughs> <laughs> it took you that took long me, what, what took so it took long me 25 man 25 years to, to make five. the top yeah the top five before that no, never the top 10 what's it take to get to number one well, that's a great question. Yeah, you know, to win, to win that, you actually really they they put a lot of an, an emphasis on a race called Western States, and another race called UTMB. So those two races get like uh, a real large amount of the points. total points. But we don't have a point system, so it's sort of it's difficult because it's sort of uh, it's definitely not like a it takes a lot of interpretation. So it's mm -hmm. open, it's open to interpretation. So there's not like a, a not real exact. fair, like mm -hmm. a science to it necessarily. Sounds so like I mean, some, uh, some people were debating that we should have gotten a higher ranking than five last year based off our, our, our races. And this year I've actually gotten, uh, I've run uh, the most ultras I've ever run in a single year with, I, I think 11. And uh, I've had a lot of wins. I had like two course records. Um, but I don't know that I'll make the top 10 list just because I think last year it really helped that I won bigs overall. And this year I was the assist at bigs. So that's a second pl place person. So I don't know. I might sneak in there as like number, you know, we'll see, number eight or nine or 10. They got to give you something but from the previous it, year it being would, number five. It, well, it, no, <laughs> no, because no, I, I think a, a lot of people who made the list last year aren't going to make the list this year. But I would say like where I really, I mean, I, yeah, it's where I do well. And um, maybe it kind of sounds like braggadocious here, man, like talking about myself like this. I think but, you've got the opportunity. But, you've done uh, the things for 25 years or you can. But where, where I do really well is yeah. doing really well in different categories. See, so like yeah. like Jim uh, Walmsley, he's he's won like Ultra Runner of the Year, I think for like the last six years. He's an amazing runner. But where he specializes is really fast races and like uh, fast 100-mile races. And like where I, I specialize, I, I do like races like the Backyard Ultra. That race is multi many days. And I do races like 24 hour races, but I also can do like really hot races, like the hottest race in the world. And I can also do really well in short races. Um, but I'm not the fastest in the country when it comes to a short race, like in an in a, in a ultra. So like 50K, uh, 50 miler, 100K. I'll do okay. I'll do pretty well, especially like across the nation, but I may not even make like the top 10 or 15, but where I'm really, really strong is a race of a hundred miles or further, especially when it has adversity. So like, I'd love to compete against Walmsley in like the backyard. But you like that because you have a competitive spirit for sure. Yeah, actually I do. I do like to, to have fun with it and i i love like you know it, i think it's good sportsmanship like i like yeah. being I, I i respect all those other people and i i like i like that I like it, it push it pushes me to be stronger and it pushes the other person to be stronger to like you know get a little nudging and you know i get a lot of nudging from people all the time so you know it's it, i i mean it it's it, the for example this backyard ultra it's it's really something while to watch it's like a lot of ultras maybe they're not quite as exciting as other sports to watch for people maybe maybe not i don't know but the backyard ultra it was exciting about it is that you just don't know who's going to win that race i mean it starts off in the first day and people everyone's tied every single lap and you don't know how it's going to evolve and people look like they start throwing up or they start falling over and other people look strong and then they rebound and you get and you just don't know what's going to happen to the end. And it, and it really takes uh, a lot of strategy. And it also takes a lot of um, the mindset. You got to get into the right mindset. And you also have to, uh, you have to really endure extremely high pressures and just go through it like, and find a way through it. So um, when I heard you talking about, hey, you might not be the fastest, all right, those hundred right. miles, maybe that that's not your specialty. But what I thought about was, as you were saying, I was like, as you're saying, I'm like, man, why is he, why does he like the long ones? And um, it takes more of a, it's a mindset one in that game, isn't it? 
is more of a mindset. Like right. the, the body is still critical. Like you have to work your body like you never dreamed before to get so ready for those kind of things. But uh, it's, it's so important, the mindset. Like you have to really just go to places and explore those places you can go to in your mind to take you through really harsh environments. All right. Yeah. The hardest moment. So that race that you just won, that 354 miler. Yeah. What was the name of that one? That is Big's Backyard World Championship. That sounds so yeah, sweet, doesn't it's it? It's now it's exploded. Like from this humble location back in Laz, this guy, crazy guy Laz. In Tennessee. In Tennessee, yeah. yeah. From his his backyard, like it's now a race and like they've got these races in over 60 countries. Like uh, thousands of people now run it. So it's kind of wild. So that 354 miler, if you go back, we're going to get into the Harvey mind here. The hardest moment of that race, mentally, when was it? Yeah, the the hardest place actually for that in that particular race was, believe it or not, it was right around about 170 some miles into it, and uh, I had uh, just it was. It's it's challenging. You're you're in this like uh, cold night. Um, basically, you go out and back uh, 4.167 miles every hour, and so it's the second night. So you're tired from the first night, staying up all night long, and then you're into the second night of of you you try to lay down, and fall asleep for five minutes or four minutes or three minutes, but. It's not really quite the same thing as having a full night's sleep. It's not? <laughs> no, not quite. Not quite. So you it, going out, it, it, you just you get to a place where if you let your mind go there, you could just be like, why am I doing this? This is or, or this is just really exhausting. You know, and it just felt uh, maybe I didn't want to give up, but I, I've, I was feeling a lot of fatigue. You know, your muscles fatigue, you're like just sleepy, you're tired, and you start to like mind starts to wander a little bit about, well, how's this going to feel in like four hours or how's this going to feel tomorrow? And we might not even be done tomorrow. So you just then you get your mind into a wrong set of like thinking. And so I went back to my aid station, which we got every 4.167 miles. You like get back to your aid station and you've got to restart the lap on the hour, every hour. That's when Laz blows the whistle. Uh, so it, when I went back, I actually like uh, quietly without anyone else hearing because they were also shooting video at the time. It was like a live feed and there were other competitors around, but I like uh, spoke real quietly with my crew member uh, who's a good friend of mine. And I just told him, I said, you know, Judd, I'm really struggling. I'm not giving up. I don't want to give up, but I just want to let you know I'm really struggling. And anything you might have to like, you can share with me to help me out now. I would just, I, I would need it. And he's like, Harvey. He's like, he thought he just came up with this idea. And I was like, damn. He's like, Harvey, just imagine you're running to work each time you go out that way. <laughs> and it worked. Like I literally just at that from that point on, every time for the nighttime loop, which is an out and back. I would just envision that I was just running to work. And running to work to me is like automatic. I've been doing it now for nine and a half years, every single day. Rain, snow, hot, cold, doesn't matter. If the cars can't make it, I'll still make it. Yeah, every day. It's just some, I don't even, I don't struggle with it because it's just something automatic. It's like putting on my clothes. It does, I don't have to wrestle with my mind. I just do it. Isn't that wild that you're the guy doing it? You're at 175 miles. You've done that loop 40-something times already. And you speak to the team and the people you've built around you, and you're like, I don't have the answer right now. If there's anything you got, give it to me. And it was the simplest thing that he feeds into your mind. And you're like, I got this. Man, how important it is to have the right people around you. It's so important. I mean, it's, it's so critical in everything we do on this planet no matter what you're involved with. I mean, having someone in your circle that you can confide in or get, uh, you know, some positive push from and choosing your circle wisely. I mean, 
I knew that having Judd there was the best possible choice. Like, I mean, and it, there's just, there was only a few people I would have selected for that role. And I mean, if I had an, any number of other people, I just wouldn't have actually been able to complete the race at the same intensity that I did, without a doubt. That's fascinating. And uh, is he a runner himself? We actually, not, not exactly, but yes, he is and he isn't because he does a lot of different things. He actually never ran a marathon until he was like uh, close to 40. Uh, and he was on this flight and on the flight, they had this documentary about the Marathon de Sables. It's a race in Morocco. And he's like, oh man, I'd like to do that. Oh, yeah, would he, he? Yeah, he just jumps right into it. So he ran, literally ran, I think he ran one marathon before he ran that race. And then we actually met in, uh, in the Marathon de Sables. Uh, they, they group you by country. And like, we happen to be sharing a tent with like, I think about 10 or 12 other Americans and South Africans, some others. And uh, yeah, we became friends through that. The friendships you developed through life. The well, ones that's you, true. Right? Absolutely. I mean, and that's worth more to me than, to be honest with you, uh, I wouldn't trade, trade that friendship for a million dollars. Yeah. What about a billion? <laughs> a billion. John, <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, John, I think he'd understand that one, maybe. But <laughs> something to think about. That's, isn't it? Uh, man, that's tough, John. That's, that's tough. <laughs> um, so, where is uh, you talked about being in Greece? You talked about Morocco. You talked about the Appalachian Trail. We've talked about Tennessee. What's a place in the world that all of us should put our eyes on? Hmm. Man, if we that's had so, just one. Man, that's so tough to answer that. Yeah, I would say, I mean, I, immediately I'd just say home. Like, because that's something that we can all touch. And it's like, uh, a lot of times we don't realize, you know, what is in our own neck of the woods. And so, I mean, like, for example, one of the things that, that I mean, I'm, I'm COVID. Like, I mean, COVID was... Uh, just so rough for our nation and for the, the world. But I have to be honest that like during COVID, I actually thrived. And like COVID, like for me, was an opportunity to uh, connect with my, my fiance. I mean, we're, we've been together for nine years, but we've never lived together for like extended periods beyond summer vacation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because she lives an hour and 45 minutes away and I commute back and forth and live in both places in Circleville and Cincinnati. So uh, that was a treasure. You get to see, that, you know, experience that time. No, we didn't like kill each other. <laughs> it was a and defining we, moment. We, we, yeah, it's a defining moment for us. And, and the other thing was, is I just really appreciated uh, the time exploring Ohio. Like, I mean, I loved um, running with my dog, Carly. You know, we, we ran, we, we went out to like, like parks are only like 30 minutes away, 45 minutes away, places I thought I knew that I had no idea about. Like I'd, I'd been to them once or twice, but I really didn't explore them. So now like I have a routine now where I, I really love uh, like Tar Hollow and Sauda Trails, uh, Great Seal. Like these are parks that I didn't even know they really much about them. I had heard of them. I've been out to them once or twice, but I didn't really know them. And Hawking Hills, all those areas. And also, uh, I, I took a little canoe trip down the Souda River uh, from Columbus to Cincinnati. So I was like 250 miles just canoeing. And I, I loved it. So I mean, I think that uh, we have a lot in our own neck of the woods and exploring that is, is like, there are places I go daily where I don't see anyone in Cincinnati, like nobody. And I mean, I'm like, this is a city of almost- 2.2 in the MSA. Yeah, when yeah. you add it all together. Mm -hmm. And like, there's areas that people just have never been in their life. Like I can guarantee it. And they're like incredible spots. And are right here. So I think this needs to be on Harvey's website if it's not. 
I need to get a, a website going. Well, I you think gotta, you need you gotta, to. Yeah. Put it somewhere, the, the yeah. place, the places in my hometown. Yeah, social media. I do share a lot of it on yeah. social media, like Harvey Lewis, Ultra Runner, on Facebook and Instagram. And I, I do like to like share that because Ohio is a beautiful state. And I think that's another thing. Like, uh, you know, I when I was a young man, I think when I was 19, I was like, oh, I want to go move to San Diego, California. Like, that's got the beach. It's got like... You're near like the national parks, it's California. And now I'm like, you know, I, I love having Ohio as a, as, a, as a launching pad. I mean, I, I do want to go to all the countries in the world and I've, I've been to 102 now. Wow. So I, I, I love exploring other countries. But every time I go away, I'm always like, well, my, my favorite country is still America. And Ohio- And my favorite is, state. It, it, it's 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 something special like ohio has got a lot to offer people you know is is a really great place to live so what do you think that it do you think that has to do something with the people is it the culture do you think that are we are we just homers because it's our hometown like could anybody find these same things you're talking about regardless of the 50 states they live in or is there something extra special that we can identify here because I feel the same way. I've, I've traveled, not I've traveled this country almost every state, um, not internationally as much. Getting ready to next week, Bam. So I'll, I'll ask you. Where are you, you headed to? Spain. Oh, that's great. Yeah, man. Down around the Mediterranean and yeah. So I'll ask you some questions. Maybe take the ferry over to Morocco every uh, ten year. Yes, yes. So, um, but the, all the traveling I did, whether I would go to Colorado Springs and drive up to Pikes Peak, you run it. I drove it. <laughs> it has <laughs> all right. No, it's all good. <laughs> um, I'm sure there's a race to the top of Pikes Peak. I'm there sure. is. Okay, yeah. of course. Yeah. Um, but um, Car you know, and running. Uh, both, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, you know, on the beach in Coronado and San Diego or in Seattle and Portland where there's a, where it's rainy a lot or beaches in Florida or Dallas, Texas and the, the plains in Kansas. I've seen all those. But it feels like there's something special when I come back and um, – do you think it's just because it's home for us, or is there? Something yeah, I special? think it's just because I think it's wherever you are, like I, it, wherever you're living in the planet. I feel like home is, is something special, you know. So you, and, and I mean, a lot of people like to move away, and and that's great. Um, I can see like the the reasons for that too, but yeah, I think that I, I don't know that it's just special with Ohio and in Cincinnati. I think that's something that people people like no matter where you're living can feel but definitely like uh you know getting outside like that's a, a strange thing i think i also look at from where we are today in the world like i feel like we have so many people are really we're busy with work we're very busy in our lives and then we're exhausted and and i love watching netflix and i love watching tv and i love watching the you know kelly and i'll watch you know, some we get into like some episode of like you know um, Stranger Things or or uh, the Queen's Gambit or or whatever. But um, or 1899 that was another really interesting one we watched recently. But um, I feel like uh, you know you don't see people outside very much a lot of times. You know, it's like even like going to like restaurants. Like I don't know, I I I've, I've got a real strange. Like um, in the dead set of, of routines, dead or winter, yeah. you still want to sit outside no, at the I, restaurant. No, I have strange right routines. No, no, no. Like, but I mean, like, I'll be, you know, it's like when I'm out running around. A lot of times, I don't see people outside very much in the evening, and then when I go to like on a weekday, if I go out and get some, like, I just went over to like PF Chains recently, and it's like, or grocery store and people are inside <laughs> like i don't know how'd it's you just, grow up then so, I, so just, I just remember people being out more and i don't know like I, i've been to cuba for example cuba is like a totally different world but it's it's or it's just interesting how people are more like there's more community of like interaction going on and like here in america we have like uh we I just feel like it's different when you go to Minnesota. When I'm in Minnesota, like there's more people out and enjoying the weather, uh, even when it's freaking cold go to there. The Boundary Waters, yeah. Baby. You've been oh up yeah, there. 
Oh yeah, and Duluth it's, and North it's, of Duluth. It's stunning. It's I awesome. love it. I love the boundary. Waters. I went on canoe trips with portages. Yeah. when I was young. Up in, yeah, it's you know, stunning. The northern boundary waters. Went over to Candle a bit. The trading post. Yeah, yeah, man, that was cool. It's so beautiful. Seeing a huge moose sit, oh, yeah. standing beside a lake. <sighs> the bald eagles. It was wild. It is. It's stunning. So, what do you think? Um, so, being outside, I, I was. I was just thinking about this last week about the different life that I was able to live then. So, I think we grew up in a similar generation. Um, I would not be happy saying you're older than me because of the way you take care of your body. However, in years, Harvey's got a couple years on me. <laughs> um, it's all good. What, we just went outside, man. That's what we did. Yeah. Right? We yeah, just we went did. outside. Yeah. And um, whatever, whether it was playing a game, whether it was carving um, trails through the woods, I remember walking creeks. I grew up here in northern Kentucky in Boone County. We would walk the creeks down to the river, down the Ohio River, and we'd just do it for hours. Yeah. Hours and hours and hours. And um, I guess I'm fortunate that maybe that world was different. Right. That it felt like that was okay for your parents to do that then. Right. But um, I think that's a lot of the foundation. You know, yeah. those, those those things. It, it just um, it makes you appreciate a lot of the simpler things in life. So I'm not a runner like you, but um, – I think there's probably some connection there. Yeah, absolutely. Might be some of the reason yeah. why you like running, maybe. Yeah, it it is absolutely some reason I, I like running. And you know, it's just, I think, and getting outside is really important for us as humans. I mean, if you like think about the whole length of human history, and how much as humans we spent outdoors, and then think about modern society, and how much time we spend outdoors today. I mean, that's one of the things about the Appalachian Trail, doing that, the like Harvey, like Son. I mean, for that journey, we literally covered 50 days where I was outside. The only time I was, like, not was when I was sleeping in a van for, like, six or seven hours and sometimes four hours. And the rest of the time, I was purely outside. And, you know, there's, there's something, like, I feel very um, calm in life. Um, like I don't get, uh, rattled very easily, like with teaching as well. Like a man might have a rough day, but just leaving work and like running home. I mean, I have the luxury to run home cause I'm not that far from my school. It's like three miles. And you know, a lot of times I take a longer route, but you know, not everyone can do that. You know, I understand that, but I think getting outdoors is really important for people's health, like their, their mental health, their physical health. And I mean, I say to my students, but it's, it's something that, you know, when I look at different cities, like that's one thing you like, if you're in Minnesota, you see a lot more people out and about. And if you're in Colorado, you see a lot more people out and about. And so I just think with the tri-state area, like we do have a lot of people who like to get outside, but I'm just saying like it, as a whole, our, we're, our, our population is, does not get out as much as like Minnesota or Colorado. And I think it would help us. So if you're, um, you touched on your students. Yeah. So do any of them run to school? Uh, not, not this year. Okay. No, not this year. We have had a couple of like cycled or, yeah. Okay. Um, so I've you've inspired, to, you've inspired I've a couple. i a few. <laughs> um, so if I had a couple of your students sitting at this table, what would they say about Mr. Lewis? I'd probably like, uh, say something funny, but, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it, it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy, like, the aspect of, like, working with young people. Like, um, people might think that, oh, yo, I'm an inspiration to my students, but actually I get an equal amount of inspiration from my students and is, is going back to, like, that circle, too. It's not always that way. Like, we have our rough days with, you know, with certain students, but um, they would probably say, oh, they, they, they think uh, I'm a little crazy, but in a good way, <laughs> like most of the time. <laughs> yeah, I, I might expect a little too much at times, but. Um, so is yeah? I mean, is that a bad thing though? Expecting too much? So. Uh, I I don't think so. Why not? Well, you know, it's I think it's really one of the things is that the if we don't think our students can do it, like they're not going to be able to do it. And like, for example, we have these air tests for the state of Ohio like that our students are, have to take. And so my goal on the air test, which, you know, it's not like the you know, AP test, but my goal is to have 100% of my students pass it. 
and you know it's uh we've had like the highest is 94 percent which is well above the state average but uh is walnut hills has a hundred percent but you know it's like uh and, and sometimes i get a little pushback they'll be like well you you really think you're gonna hit a hundred percent why why do you want to put that down as our goal <laughs> your students say, no oh, <laughs> I'll say, okay yeah but but uh no uh i may i may get some some uh, some adults that say that um but uh yeah don't, i mean don't you have to dream yeah. though yeah, I mean, it's like I just think that I want every one of my students to have a, a true uh, chance to be successful with whatever they want to do in life. And that every one of my kids is absolutely capable of learning. Uh, you know, some of them struggle with, with items, but it's not – they have their own level of intelligence. It's like there's the multiple intelligences. So you got you – know, some kids might be really gifted in, in like – fine arts and some kids might be really gifted with computers i mean i, I need computer help all the time for my students so it's like it, it, it's like getting them to recognize that is also really important because like a lot of kids don't realize what they're capable of it's just like going back to where i was when i was in, in doing the marathon in in the high school like i, I was just a, a chubby kid like a year and a half or two years before that that wouldn't have dreamed to run to the end of my street. There was no way that was going to happen. So it, it was really, when I did that marathon, it really, it really changed my mindset. And like, uh, so I do try to create like experiences that are difficult, but I also try to create, I, I don't want them to, yeah, I'm not, I don't want them to, you know, give up. Like I want them to just work through difficult situations so does that come from um you know it's my job to find out who the guests are going to be so um i try not to get too personal but you came from a place of adhd as a kid right yes yeah i was uh i mean that's my self-diagnostic <laughs> Like, hey, listen, like, if like you back can, then they didn't really like call like they didn't have like what uh, they what they call you what they say I, about honestly, you. I was in special education and I was uh, I really struggled with reading and I I learned to eventually pick it up like in in late like probably third fourth grade, but I was at least a couple years behind my my peers in terms of like reading comprehension and. I really struggled. I, I didn't like the stigma of being identified as like special education. Who would? Uh, yeah, I just didn't like that at all. So I really wanted to get out of it. Like, I mean, I remember in eighth grade, I was, I was just, I mean, all throughout middle school, I was really embarrassed about that. And it just made me want to get out of that. Um, but I struggled with school all the way up until... I'd say definitely 10th grade. I mostly had like D's, F's, C's, all the way up until 10th grade. And then when I did have that, when I had that experience with the marathon, it did, it did, it did harden my like mindset. So even at that young age. So once that occurred and I got into 10th grade, like my mind had started to shift. Like I was really like, okay, this is a matter of me spending the time plus i want to go to college so i had motivation isn't that fascinating man i think because if you look at um i won't drag you into the, the deep water of this conversation but if you look at public education today it's fascinating i'm really i'm not going to go there i'm just going to express this and see you know you take all these scores from like a walnut hills you brought it up right and they're a hundred percent um and then you could go to whatever the lowest performing school is in the same district. And it's like, man, those kids started the same. When they were born, for the most part, on average, they started the same. Well, unfortunately, not exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, so we can talk about it if you want. Yeah, because I have mean, I've been teaching now for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And when I first started off, I, I was an intern at Western Hills High School. And then I, did, uh, I had five years at Taft High School back before it really made the transitions with the information technology and the help from Cincinnati Bell. Uh, and it was a really rough school. Um, but when I think about education, our country is, is really, 
it's 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 such a product of our our form of government like i mean federalism so you have each state you know directs its own you know education which is really fantastic to have it at the local level um but even you go beyond that and you got you know each district is is funded from you know local local taxes so i mean it's like there's already a disadvantage there because if you're talking about like ohio for example uh vinton county is like the poorest county in ohio and i mean they just don't have the tax base of like hamilton county for example i mean a teacher in vinton county is likely to get paid maybe 60 percent of a teacher in hamilton county maybe 65 percent there's a there's a difference maybe 70 percent so it's gonna there's gonna be a, a you know, I mean, there's people are passionate to go into education no matter what they're paid, but there still is an impact on whether you have like our students all have lap or laptops, you know, all across CPS, Society of Public Schools. But if you're in Benton County, you may be using, you might, you probably don't have that. You might have a computer room, maybe using textbooks that are 15 years old. I mean, that's just a reality. Like, so there is differences, you know, if you are Indian Hill School District. You know, how, how luxurious is that? Like you got like access to tremendous resources and there is difference with those resources. One now within the district. Yeah. I mean, I, I've seen kids. It's true. There are kids that start off from really uh, rough circumstances that make it into Walnut and Excel. But on if you look at averages and numbers like kids that come from backgrounds where they have exposure to to parents that, that have, you know, provided like, or they might be examples with strong careers, or they they provided like the necessary, you know, uh, ingredients for like to to fulfill like what's required in your basic needs. Like, there's a difference. Like, I mean, I have kids that they don't. Uh, yeah, I've I've had I've homeless kids. I have kids that like uh, have trauma in their life. I have kids that have gone through crazy, crazy, crazy things, and they're still trying to, to, to show up, but it's, it has an impact, like in terms of their mental health and like the ability that they like can focus. I mean, it's like, if it's, if you haven't eaten, then like thinking about some air tests is like minimal on your importance scale. You know, it really is. So yeah, I truly believe in this, you know, there is, there is that I, I've always believed it that you can you can come from like a, a difficult circumstances like you mentioned yourself like you had to come from being in 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 poverty mm -hmm. food, food stamps at times I mean that's amazing yeah. to to what you've created this day uh, but so but I think that's, that's, a, that's a, 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 a outstanding and that's that's a that's a, a tribute to yourself and your whoever Help to mom. your mom. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. When Isn't the, that because a dad pulled us down, trying yeah. to take us to the deep water. Yeah. And the mom pulls you back. It's but, a, it's, a, it's amazing. And it, so that that is what's special also about our country. Yeah. You know, I mean that's that's absolutely amazing. But but I also see on averages like that it doesn't always work that way. And but your mind your mind does have a huge impact as well as who you encounter on your journey right. that helps to push you in the right direction so i think that um i think that's what i meant a little bit in the beginning is we all start the same place i meant from the womb oh yeah i don't <laughs> yeah. i don't mean even who our parents are because that's a huge impact it's huge right but i just um it's disappointing to me that the kids that when they begin um, i use an analogy of baseball like a baseball diamond and there's some kids in life that they just start on second base nothing against them their family the people that are around them how they value education they just allow them to start on second base they just got there without having to swing without having to run and then there's some kids that just start in a dugout that don't even get to start that don't even get the attempt at the at bat and that's the disappointing thing to me and in this world with rights you're not going to take kids out of their homes right you wish you could i wish i could if there's parents and families that don't care about them I, I literally wish that we could just take them away from them and because at that point i don't think it's about the parents rights it should be about what what about the rights of that kid to have the same opportunity whatever that is so that's what's disappointing to me that if i was in your job every day um you're awesome because the optimistic approach that you take but i think i'd get so frustrated about seeing the things 
you know, it's like the product you're given, mm. right? Mm. And um, I'd feel terrible for the kids. I yeah. would. And so, but then I think I'd, what would react inside of me? I'm like, hey, what can I do? Mm. What mm. can I do? Like, how can I, how can I make these kids just believe a little bit? And I think that's, there, there's this story. If you can get them to the point where they decide to run that marathon, but at the same time, you had to have your mom there who said, okay, let's sign you up. Without that, do you go all the way? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Right? So yeah. so it's like how do we get them to a place where they accomplish, where they make a decision, where they start something, that then they accomplish something and have a sense of success. And it's like, oh, okay, I'm resilient. I can do things I didn't know that I could do. And um, that's not just formal education. That's not just academia. You know, I just I'm I'm looking for a way to do that every day with adults, because that's the world I'm in. Right. right. But I'm working with the people that Harvey gives us. Oh man, <laughs> that's good. Well, hey, I've got to get you some more students. <laughs> <laughs> got- uh, so I guess what do you do? Just go out here and fight every day and just try to make the difference that you can. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, you know, it it sometimes I feel like a, it's an episode of uh. I I love Lucy where they're like they have this assembly line and all the products coming down the line they're trying to move as fast as possible and things are flying everywhere I mean it it, I don't ever sit down usually I mean if if I am I'm like just working trying to so as soon as I get to the school to the moment I leave it's usually like go 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 and it's I mean they keep me busy and it makes it interesting and they're hilarious I mean I've got some SCPA has some phenomenal like students and we're a very diverse school mm-hmm. i mean i love that about our school it's, it's we've got probably one of the most diverse schools in the midwest and i mean if, if you haven't been to one of our our performances like the major musical it's absolutely like it's like aronoff quality i mean actually i think it's better than aronoff <laughs> sorry aronoff <laughs> but, <laughs> but it just but is right? it just is it's really good yeah. i really think it's and, and we have an amazing staff i mean uh administration everything so um yeah i mean it's it, you just try to do your 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 thing but i mean it's like everyone has a role uh in and i feel like in education like you know it's like uh it, it's just is a definitely like it's a it's a community event it takes a whole community uh i give you an example like there's a man that uh i came across last year because i had a student she was actually homeless uh, or like her, her, they were like living in a transitional type of situation, like in a hotel, motel. Um, but she wanted to get to school on a bicycle. And I was like, okay, well, I got to get you a bike then, you know? So I looked on like Craigslist and I found this guy in Cincinnati, uh, Jeff. And uh, I was like, I called him up. I said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm looking for a bike and, and such and such. And we started talking. He's like, okay. And so I go over to get the bike, and he's like, "I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna let you buy this bike." He's like, he gave me the bike, and he gave me a, a helmet, the, the the lock, all that. It was so kind of him. Yeah. And then afterwards, he's like, "I want to keep in touch with you." He's like, "I want you to tell me anytime you have a student that needs a bike." And to be honest with you, tomorrow I'm gonna go get another bike uh, for another student of mine. And it's it's so kind of this guy. I mean, he he, he no one else knows about it. Now they do. Now they do. <laughs> you know, that's first. Now they do. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's generous of him. That, you know, he, he does this kind of like as a side side uh, side hustle, you want to say. Like, it's not his main, main gig. Um, but he's got, like, scores of bikes in his garage. And he's like, man, if I can give away some bikes to help kids. Because, you know, I, when he said he shared this story when he was growing up, it, then his – Elementary, I'm sorry, I'm, yeah. I'm off mic there. That's good, man. His, You're okay. his, his elementary school teacher uh, had given him a, a coat that really uh, made an impact on his life. So I was like, man. Yeah, I guess mm. that, that's the point of it all, right? I don't think individually, most of us aren't going to be the people that are going to change the world by themselves. So you just start in the community with the people that you're around, all right, and just make the change and the impact that you can, and, and you know, by what by the care that you have for your kids and the passion that you have for teaching, which is evident um, by the people that are in your network and your world. And you found Jeff, who's the guy that's putting bikes together. And then you say, Hey, I have this and I'm willing to pay you, but he doesn't. There's a lot of awesome attributes to our communities. I think that's just what we have to focus on. Just go all in there, you know? Um, but this mindset thing, I think guys like you, because 
I go back to, I can't even fathom. I work long hours, and I've done that for 18 years in real estate, long hours. Um, what kind of hours are we talking about here? Hours that aren't healthy. Uh, yeah, like 80-plus hours or something like that. Every, every week. <laughs> every week. For 18 years. 18 years. And so, so I know when you can just come from basic average or below average places that I come from, I know what's possible, just like you do. And even though I have these crazy hours I work, and in my world people, they're like, man, that guy's nuts and he's crazy. I think you're a little more crazy because I can't even imagine what 300 miles of running is. I, I just can't. And so for me to elevate my mind to go to another place of what I'm capable of, I know what it was like at 170 miles when you thought about, hey, man, I just need something. What are all those thoughts? Like, where's your mind go? And 300 yeah. miles, it's all you. You're alone. Yeah. What are, what's your mind tell you? Yeah, so I usually break it down into small units. So I always, like, focus on, in that particular race, just every hour. And I, I do the best I can to not think ahead. So I may think just for a snapshot, like, oh, wow, we're already at mile 200. Or I may think, okay, just for a snapshot, all right, I know this is going to go at least to 300 miles. I, you know, but then I, I try to take that away, and I just focus on the moment at hand, the, the next hour. Because that's all, if I start thinking beyond that, I'll lose myself. Like, I just have to focus on that. And a lot of times it's about, like, within that, that time focusing on the strategy and like elements like okay i need to make sure i drink this eat this i need to get some of that uh my new or my other two times you shirt i need to like uh i need to do something so there's a lot of things are happening in my mind and when you're really tired it's hard to remember a list so you're running and you're trying to think okay I got three things I got to do when I get back to that tent. So that takes up a little bit of mind, mind. And then when you're doing that, it's actually positive because you're not thinking like, oh, I'm like totally disaster, wiped out. I don't even, I try not to think about the discomfort, but that helps. Uh, the other thing I do is on the trail, there's 11 hours on the trail and it's, a, it's like about 400 feet of, of climbing and it's got little technical areas and we're not allowed to have music on the trail most of the time. Sometimes Laz lets us in the later days when it's like third or fourth day. Um, but on the road, you can have music. So I actually like to listen to music because it, I don't ever take any pain medicine. Uh, there are some, you know, maybe ultra runners that, that might do that, but I think it's a bad idea. Like I think it's a bad idea because it's rough on your kidneys. And it's also really, it's, it's like you're going to mask something that could be an injury or you're not going to respond to it. So I just, I believe that everything that's discomfort, I have to deal with it like through my mind. And that's how I do it. So I like will listen to music if I'm feeling like, and, I, and I'm not running through pain like in terms of joint pain or, or uh, I did break my hand <laughs> in the race. So that was, would have been pain, but it was more like numbness. Uh, Did you keep so running? I kept running. Yeah. So I that race, I like envision myself par sometimes as, as the honey badger. So there's a really funny Those are YouTube. Mean animals, they're man. mean animals. <laughs> and and there's a really funny like YouTube video. If you've never seen it, it's, seen, it's like had like 10 million views. I mean, it's like this guy narrating the honey badger, and it's like honey badger gets in a fight with a king cobra, and the cobra bites him. And the honey badger passes out. And then the honey badger wakes back up and eats the cobra. <laughs> you know, it's like, so that was my mindset in the race. And it was, it was like, no matter what happened, I was just going to keep going until I literally passed out. Or, you know, I was so broken that I couldn't even move. But otherwise, I was just going to keep going to the very last person. And it was in my mind. I mean, it's really tough. You've got uh, you know, 30 other runners who are all champions at other backyards competing at this race. So these are really hard, hardened people. I mean... Uh, so why do you think you're the one in that moment? Why are you the one? 
I had the the at that particular race, I had some things working for me. I I had uh, prepared for the race, so I really worked hard to prepare. I mean, I worked hard. I mean, I worked, I worked, I worked hard. I worked like, I ran two, three days, three times a day. I mean, every day. There wasn't a day I ever took off. Like, and I'd run, like tonight. Like, I, we're, we'll finish um, this podcast. I'm gonna go run for a couple hours. Like, I just run. I don't know what time I get home. It doesn't matter. It'll be like 10 o'clock. That's fine. It doesn't matter. You're an animal, so I, man. So I keep training. I train very hard. But I also like have a lot of good strategies. So I'm a, I'm, I'm a good strategist. And I watch, I'm like, I, I like observe, I observe the other people. I, I like playing. I like the psychological competitive element to the race too. You know, you, you, there's a lot of psychology that goes into the fight, you know, the battle. And uh, also I have surround myself with the best crew chief. <laughs> John, who I was telling you about, he was the best of anyone that could have been there for any team. And so, you know, when you surround yourself with like amazing people, uh, that helps for amazing stuff to happen. So it took you. See, I just this is something that every day I'm looking for the algorithm to transfer to people I'm around. Because I think. What I found is, and when I started this real estate company, I said, man, everyone wants to live a better life. That's a fundamental belief I've had, but they don't know how. I don't know why they don't know how. I don't know why you know how to do it via ultra marathons and accomplish the top level. I don't know why whatever limited amount of success I've had, right, I've achieved a decent amount, but there's still a long way to go. Um a long game and i'm sitting here listening to that story you're like well it's a lot of factors i'm like okay but it all comes down to this place that in your mind you're like i'm not quitting and you're like okay well i trained i had the right crew chief right and so what i'm sitting here thinking is like oh you learned all that you learned all that that was important through all the losses that you had all the second place finishes every race you've you've run because you were looking at it like hey i'm i'm gonna do this for a long time and I want to be better, and it's an analytical game, let me learn something every time. And without all those races, without all those losses, you probably wouldn't know that all the strategy was important. No, no. <laughs> yeah, that is that's absolutely true. It's, uh, it, it definitely informed all that. And so That's what I'm wondering. Did you know along the way? Did you know that was important along the way that all those lessons you were learning? Oh, no way. I did not. I mean, I honestly, I never even imagined that it was possible to do the things I'm doing today. Like back when I was in my 20s, I thought like 130 miles in 24 hours seemed like a lofty, somewhat lofty goal. Oh, that's lofty. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. Oh, it's <laughs> yeah. lofty. And so it's wild because, you know, this this year, for example, I, I won, I got the record on the course I ran my first ultra in back in 96 and back in 96 I ran this race I ran 81.25 miles it, over 24 hours and it was a run walk type deal but I was, I was just elated to get 81.25 miles and then uh, this is 26 years later you know, I've just I've been back to this race I think eight or eight maybe seven times yeah seven times and I got the course record with 148 point six eight miles it's just wild like that uh you know it's my mind is different today than it was when i was in my 30s i wouldn't have thought that was possible <laughs> yeah it's wild it's it's interesting because you know we do put a a uh governor on our ourselves at times with what we think is achievable and what's achievable and and that's where you know Today, I feel like my, my record in the 24 hours, 160.609 miles. And I got that in 2019 in Albi, France at the World Championship. And, and uh, I'm not the best in the world at the 24 hour race, but I, I'm not, I feel like I can still beat that 160 mile mark, which is kind of neat at 46. Like, I think I'm, I really believe I'm still going to get higher mileage than that. And I don't know, I might be a little delusional, but 
it's kind of fun to think that way. And I, I like that. I think that that fits with the, the entrepreneurial spirit too, because you think about, you know, what are we capable of, of achieving is in our own lives with whatever you dream of doing and to have like those, you know, goal plans for like, okay, what's our goal today? The goal for the week, the goal for the month, the goal for the year, the goal for the next five years, where are we going with this? Like what, how do we, and yeah. So, I mean, it's like, there's a fire inside it is, you know, I, I li- just listened to David Goggins' podcast. Oh, with man. I Joe was Rogan. S- 10 minutes ago, yeah, I was, I was like, about to ask you, yeah, do you listen yeah, to the most recent I li- one? I just listened to it. And I'm like, man, you know, I, I do admire David Goggins. Like, I, I like the guy. And, and we, we've, we've run races together. And, uh, you know, um, but uh, he certainly has a way that he's managed to really uh, just connect with people. I love what he's been able to achieve. And also you see like what he's, I mean, just the, the personal like uh, hardships he had to endure, Man. like growing up in, in Indiana, like, I mean, in a, in a, in a very uh, non-diverse community and like with the, the, the with terrible things with his father. I mean, and and just the the amazing achievements he had with the military as well as like I love that he's he he's used ultras to like you know show what is capable yeah, what's of the possible. Human, human body. You know it's interesting because we both have have different approaches. Like I I hear what he says, and he's like I hate running, I hate running every day. I do it. I hate the running. I hate it, uh, but I I get out there and I get it and I'm you know stay hard with it, and and I mean that's great because a lot of people look at running and like exercise as being something that's like just difficult. Yeah, and it is difficult when you're first into it, like the first couple of weeks. Or, you know, it, it's difficult in different stages. Um, but for me, it's like I love running. I like I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, so no, do it's you, not, I don't every day love it. I mean, there are days I really have to push myself to get out the door as well. But I don't have time, to, you know, look at my shoes for 30 minutes and think about running. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to get to work. <laughs> so, you know what I think um, what's special about that is, is that uh, you can accomplish the same things different ways. Absolutely. And I mean, that's a great thing about ultra running. I mean, it's like, I think overall, like with our sport, there is a lot of support for each other. And, uh, you know, like, you know, we talk about David. I mean, I, I really admire what he's done because he's actually elevated the sport of ultra running because there are so many people that would have no idea about what bad water is or about 100 mile races, 24 hour races, were it not that they didn't read his book. And I personally met people that have literally started running just because they've read Can't Hurt Me. Mm-hmm. And I think that is just incredible. So, I mean, uh, I I personally love what what he's meant to, you know, thousands of people as well as the sport. Hmm. The um, is anybody else in your life were they runners? My sister, yeah, yeah. That's and, and I guess my dad, um, he was maybe when he was a young man, but uh, yeah, my sister, she she used to run like track uh, when when we were she was in high school. And uh, at that point, I was like, man, this is crazy. Yeah, uh, that was the time where I just really only think about chasing an ice cream truck down the street or running to the end. Like, running to the end of the street seemed like, that's too far. Hey, man, I still like chasing the ice cream truck. Oh, I know. Me too. <laughs> Me too. Oh, yeah. I don't believe it. Hey, um, you know, we had a special guest stop in here this week, um, Santa Claus. Actually, oh, yeah. actually, truly Santa Claus. And uh, he gave me a huge candy cane that he said that his crew just made. So I'll give it to you, man. I know how much you probably eat that sugar all the time. So. <laughs> it's very kind of you. <laughs> I know it would be. The, um, so it, Thank you. Yeah, man. I think that um, what we can try to do out here, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated to see what you're going to do from 46 to 56. I don't know why we look at this yeah. segment in a year and five years and ten years. But um, what do you think that's going to be? What's your yeah. brain telling you? Yeah, I, I actually really, uh, I have a friend who's uh, literally, he's almost 101. 
and his name is Mike Fremont. He actually lives in greater Cincinnati. And he's the baddest ass man alive that's anywhere close to his age. Like, I mean, anybody that's a centenarian, no, no one even resembles Mike Fremont. I mean, this guy can still do 13 pull-ups. And he runs uh, five miles three times a week. And he canoes seasonally two times a week. You know, it's, it's pretty amazing what he still drives. He still, like, has his, uh, int- his, his groups uh, that he gets together with with friends. And, I um, mean, he, he, he's... He and his wife have a really, you know, high quality of life for, for and, he, and you know, the amazing thing is, is he says, he said, Harvey, this is the happiest time of my life. And I mean, like so many people think, uh, you know, um, that, that things are, are over with at certain stages at life. And I mean, even my fiance, not to pick on Dave Ramsey here, but she said, you know, she, she's using a little bit of Dave Ramsey's curriculum. And he had something on there and he said something to the effect that like, oh, yeah, when you hit 30, you know, your knees start getting bad and you really can't. You have to make sure you're saving for that. Now, I totally agree with the saving principle. But my, my fiance, she wisely like stopped the tape and she's like, all right, kids, that is totally not true. <laughs> she's like, you know, it, it, it's 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 like, well, yeah, if you think when you're like 25 or 30, you've, you're over the hill, then you're going to live up to that like effect. You know, but it's it's what you're putting into your 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 yourself. Like you know, what are you feeding yourself in terms of your the words you say, as well as like what what you're doing with your life experience. But but yeah, so I'm I'm excited for like the next ten years because I hope to like have a positive impact on on other people to help to like. Uh, help them with the quality of life like that's real important to me so i mean with my students we we we, we do financial literacy in government but every tuesday i open up with like a health tip of the day and it's you know i feel like if you look at the things that are are really impacting our country like we're spending uh, like a is it close to about a third of our federal budget on health care you know what i mean and and we have remarkable uh, medicine in this nation. I mean, my stepmother has stage four cancer, but she's being treated at the Mayo Clinic, and they think that she may actually not die of cancer. She may die of something else in old age, which is remarkable. I survived breaking my neck, and uh, you know, I have titanium in my neck that was done by Dr. Mandiver locally here back in 2004. From a car wreck, right? From a car wreck, yeah. And I mean, some of the one of the young residents at the time told me he said I was like well what what long-term issue might I have and he said well you might have like uh arthritis um you know things like that and 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 when I left the hospital like they got me out of there pretty quick <laughs> you know pretty quick oh uh, like I think three or four days you know like they wanted to, yeah like really and um you know when I left the hospital they gave me a tire giant um big container of uh, Vicodin and literally I, I said to myself I'm not going to take any pain medicine like once I left the hospital and so I left the, the hospital and I didn't take a single pill like what I did is I literally started walking and I and I was teaching summer school at the time and I didn't stop teaching so I just walked to work I walk each day it was like it wasn't super far it was like from Eden Park to Taft High School, which was about maybe two miles, and two and a half miles. And um, that w- walking, it, the first couple of days were really miserable. <laughs> I can remember laying in bed, unable to sleep, just feeling like throbbing in my you know back and neck or just, just feeling like real tight and things and inflammation. Um, but the walking actually helped to uh, make an immense impact, alleviate the pain. Like motion is a lotion, like walking. So everyone, everyone is listening to this. Like it would be ideal to get out and, and do something physical with at least like, you know, 15, 20 minutes of your day, like every day. And it's going to cause like endorphins to kick off. It's going to cause you to have a little time mentally to think to yourself about what's important, what you want to focus in on, uh, to to just calm your spirit, like it's huge. That that was giant, and uh, 
So what? So not to interrupt. Cause, no, no, cause, go, cause, go, go. Because it kicked off about you know you were talking about a third of our budget is spent on medicine and modern medicine's amazing, but you're fascinating because three to four days in the hospital, you have titanium still from breaking your neck. How quick were you walking? Yeah, so they had me up and going. Like they they want to do that. It's like that you know, week, you get the next week, immediately. Like okay. I mean, within a, a couple of days. You know, fortunately, I didn't have any paralysis. I had some numbness on my like thumb and fingers, like from like nerve damage, but it repaired itself. So what time. about Harvey's brain told you I needed to get up and walk? Why? Yeah. Well, I mean, honestly, like because when when I was in that moment after the accident when I was in the hospital and I found out that I broke my neck, like, you know, it was like, okay, then this, this, you're looking at the, the directions this could take and you're like, okay, well, the, yeah, it's, it, there's maybe a 5% chance you might die. Like that's not that bad, but still 5%, you, you know, you don't want to play Russian roulette with one in 20 bullets, you know, you don't really want to do that. So you're like thinking there, okay, okay, so this is all coming together tomorrow. I'm going to have this surgery after they tried traction. They put like these spikes in my head and we go, like tried to reorganize my, my neck that way, but it didn't work. So, I mean, while I was there just laying in the bed, just absolutely dehydrated because I couldn't drink anything. And I mean, I kept on begging the, the beautiful nurses there. Like they just happened to have like the most beautiful nurses they were on the front of nursing weekly yeah, I, mean, huh? I mean i don't know what was happening but i was like what is going on here i'm like the most beautiful nurses i'm like in this very awkward situation <laughs> then you have to get a catheter put in like that that is not very pleasant but uh yeah i was absolutely dehydrated just sort of you know uh cajoling the nurses like can i just have like a little bit of the, you know, squeeze from a sponge you know, on my you? tongue. Before surgery, they don't no. allow you to have anything Nothing. like the eat or drink, at least at, in, in that occasion back then. So, and I don't know if I, but yeah, that's what it was. And uh, so, I mean, I had time to think about these things and think about life. And, you know, it was, I could have been paralyzed. I mean, there was no guarantee. So, I mean, there was a period there before the surgery the next day where it's like, okay, this, this might be it. Like in, and know, going back to, it was on the 4th of July and this car spun out in front of me and like literally they were, they, they spun out on like kind of an area that had some oil buildup. And then I went to break, I was a hundred meters back, but when I braked, I literally was going to go right towards them. I went off the road to the right, and then my car got sideways into this ditch and just rolled like four times. And, I mean, I was upside down. Like, I mean, as the car was rolling, I was like, wow, I was not planning to die today. Like, there's so much more I wanted to do. So when the car, like, ended up upside down, I tried to break break out the glass, on, and um, the glass wouldn't break, like, out, out the right and left side windows. So I looked in the back and I had heard my neck crack during the process of the car pushing the top of the hood or the top of the vehicle pushing down my head. But I didn't know that I actually broke my neck because I thought, you know, back before this time, I thought if you break your neck, you're dying, you know. So I ended up crawling out the back of the car and I got myself cut up with a glass and stuff like that. But when the fire truck, uh, when I climbed out, like, I mean, I felt like uh, I was on top of the world. Like, I was like, man, I just escaped, like, a, a car that was submerged 100 feet underwater. You know, this was something, like, I thought it was going to explode. So, I mean, that was the first instance where I was like, wow, you know, I'm, like, so thankful to be alive here. And then, the, then the, to have that period of time where going from finding out that I broke my neck and things are not looking good at all to, to having the surgery the next day that that's another period where i was like okay i could i could end up dead i could be per paralyzed my whole world can change you know and fortunately i ended up on the other side of that and yeah i had the discomfort and you know there was no one that told me that things were that you could do even more than you did before when you broke your neck no one said that like the doctors didn't mention that part <laughs> I was like, well, that, that's part of the whole package. I didn't know that. Yeah, so, I mean, I just started walking back and forth to work. And then, 
uh, there were like rules about what I could do. I had this like neck brace on all the time. And uh, then, then after like uh, three months, I ran the Columbus Marathon, like just hopped back into it. Uh, after I got the neck brace off, ran the Columbus Marathon. And my time then was like an hour and 20 minutes slower but then before, hour and a half slower. I don't know how long. It took me about a whole year to get back to where I was prior to that, like hitting like uh, around the three hour 15 mark or something like that. And then um, it just just kept going. Like I just kept on chiseling away, chiseling away. It was like I always envisioned I like the film The Count of Monte Cristo and also Shawshank's Redemption. So I kind of think of it a little bit like Shawshank's. That like there's this tunnel. I'm <laughs> just like chipping chip it away, chipping it away. No, no one's really seeing what's going on there. And all of a sudden, like, what has happened? <laughs> so I was just chipping away at it. And yeah, so I mean, it literally took me like six years from there to win that 100 mile race, which was kind of an obscure little 100 mile race in Ontario. And then just chipping away, chipping away like adventures, going to India, following Gandhi's salt march, 241 miles, like going down to Selma, running the Selma Civil Rights March, like uh, going and seeing these people that inspired me. So then going to Haiti, like, so I mean, going to Haiti and doing 100K from Port-au-Prince uh, and meeting like David, one of my friends who is a remarkable individual. And like, when I go to these developing countries, like one, one lady I remember in Haiti, like she was so poor, she was carrying like trash, like from a, I mean, ever there's a lot of trash everywhere, unfortunately in, in Haiti. Um, cause they don't really have really good trash organization, but I mean, literally she was making money from like carrying something out of the trash area that would maybe be worth like 10 cents or five cents in America. And like, that's like an hour of her work. And it's like, you think about the type of hardships that people are experiencing outside America or you know, in these developing countries. And in some cases it's places inside America. And you think about these hardships. And like, when I think about that, when I'm running bigs, I do think about it. And it just gives me a lot of spirit, like an energy. So there's a couple things here. You don't have a coach. No, I don't actually. I don't have a coach, but I I also kind of consider like the people that have have informed my 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 life story along the journey as as all being part of that coaching. You know, my dad. Like I mean, just seeing his his resiliency like in his 80s, my stepmother, the way that she interacts with people and like her relationship with people as a social worker, my, uh, you know, I mean, my, my, my partner, my fiance, you know, uh, my, my mother, like she overcame that stroke that she had in 1995. She's still living independently. She has a speech impediment and she has like a limited mobility, but she lives independently. And like, that's some incredible resiliency there. I mean, it's like, you know, there's a lot of really resilient people in this world and people are like neighbors, people that don't get credit for what they're doing, uh, that, that are remarkable people. You know, when I'm running through Cincinnati, believe it or not, like I see people every day, like every day I see one of my students, every single day I see one of my students, someone that follows me on social media, perhaps some other runner, even like the, um, the workers in in uh, the the city park workers, the garbage truck like they they know me. <laughs> I will say when I go up through there, there's a there's a whole group of them. I'm like, hey, what's up, going? On? And they'll be like, ah. So I get some nice like it's almost like it is it's like that that scene from Rocky where he's running through like the little market. And he's getting the positive cheers. I get that kind of positive cheers from people uh, in our community. And that makes me want to really strive. So, I mean, it's like interesting. You look at like a professional sports team, like the Bengals or like the Reds. And like, you know, it, it, it's so interesting. Like just on my run here today, I saw like the last um, two or three guys were leaving the practice squad over there 
for the Bengals. And they've been on quite a winning streak right now. But, all right, now I'm going to start talking some smack again. <laughs> I <don't want> to. <laughs> all right, let me bail you out on this. You better, you better so, go. So, so, so this is good. I mean, no, no, this go. is good. Um, so what do you think um, when you think on all those hours and hours of running? Do you think there should be a general purpose of this life? Because that's where my mind has been a ton. And it's almost like a compound effect in life where you just learn something new based upon what you learned yesterday. And it starts opening up your mind where you just go to these places trying to figure out, like, what's this about? What's my role? What's my job here? What's my responsibility? And um, we have to balance selfishness and selflessness because we all have some of both what's this purpose of life yeah it's it's uh that's such a critical thing because literally it's like your why statement and when it like for example with my a races like i actually write out a why statement which is unique i don't know a lot of people do that and i don't do that with all my races only like four races maybe a year and it's like finding that why is, is so critical. And it's what I'm trying to do with my students as well. Because it's like right now, it's exciting because I have juniors and I have a, a senior and one sophomore. But it's like they're at this exciting crossroads where there's so many different directions they can take life. And it's like finding their why or purpose is like the number one thing that can really – like ignite your fire you know it's 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 so critical for me personally it, there i've got lots of whys so i mean I, I i i get you know i do as a teacher like we do kind of have like a, a a little bit of an altruistic bend where we we have an interest in like you know helping others um but i also like uh being a lifelong learner like i mean you know it, if i'm like it, not just running. I mean, the reason I, I, I kind of admire Mike Fremont so much is because it's like he's continuously learning. You know, I, I, I interact with the guy and he's always bringing me articles every time I see him. <laughs> he's got like a, a, a stack of magazines and articles for me to read. I'm like, Mike, I can't keep up with all this reading here, buddy. But it's like, I love that. Like there, this idea that it's like life is an adventure and it's it's exciting because it's dynamic and it's changing and it's like it's it, it has its it's it's it can have its extremely you know it's it's dark places as well but you know the the excitement is in the adventure of like the unknown too you know like where we're going with it so what's so, the purpose of this why why is the, why is that so important to establish that so on your A races. Yeah. So that, that's what keeps me motivated in the game. So like, for example, when I get to that place where most people would quit, where what keeps me driven is that why. What is, what is it that's, that's propelling me? What, why, why must I not quit? Why must I continue? And, and if I don't write that down, I, I might, might let it go. And so I literally like to write it down. It's for the tough times. For the tough times. That's what we found. That's what I found is, um, you know, I'm not the type of friend that is going to be around when you're having a party. just doesn't mean that much to me. Um, I just pride myself on trying to be that guy who, when the chips are down, that that's when I show up. Like on those bad days, on those days when it's really tough to get through life, someone passes away and you're there to give the hug when maybe it's not a natural time for a dude to give another dude a hug, right? To just sit there and listen to somebody when they're having the tough times. Why? Your why is the same thing. Because there are times all of us have had too much. You're wondering like, man, is this my pain threshold? Is this it? Because I, 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 I haven't reached it yet. Like, is, is this it? And if you can figure out what that why is, I don't know if in life it's too big, but even in the moments, um, you'll keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Because it's painful, you know, when you get to those moments where there's massive adversity. 
and you're having to reach down and figure out like is there another level of resiliency Mm -hmm. right is there enough perseverance here um if you can establish that why before the hard time comes i think you'll keep going i think so um and you know simon sinek has something about that i don't know if you've ever if you know about him and the book Mm -hmm. he's read he established it i forget the name of his book but he thinks that's the most critical thing as well yeah and um you know it's easy on the good days to keep going when the students are in good moods, when the weather's nice on the good run, when your right. body's feeling good. Oh, yeah. And you're thinking like, oh, man. yeah, you're right. You're at mile 50 and you're like, man, was it what I ate? <laughs> was it just I had good sleep? Yeah. Right? It's those, it's those tough times. And um, maybe that's our job, to try to help people figure out their why. You for yeah, your students, me for my realtors and people that want to change their life financially. Um, it's important. But I didn't always know my why in the beginning. Mm-mm. No. How do we find it? How'd you find, how do you find that? Like when you're searching it out for one of your A races. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's like, I, for me, people. Like, I mean, people is a real important aspect to it. So, I mean, it's like, I feel like we do, if I'm doing it for myself, I'm not as driven as if I'm doing it for somebody else. Or I'm doing it for, like, a cause. Uh, something that compels me. So, I mean, uh, like, it, it's, it's got to be for something more than yourself. I feel, I feel like to reach that highest pinnacle, I mean, you could be driven to do things for, you know, your, your own motivations. And, and uh, but to, like, reach that highest level, it's when you're reaching to, you know, help someone else. Uh, to... We did this, so we were not successful in getting the fastest known time on the Appalachian Trail. We we came in like eighth fastest. Damn time. it, Harvey! I know we would not make it, but you know it was not for the part of of not trying. I mean, I I was I broke my body so many times on that trail, and it seemed that it was like insurmountable weight on my shoulders. Like I mean, I I literally one time felt like. I, if, if I was supposed to, if I was to make a metaphor, I was said it was it was like the equivalent of having a sumo wrestler laying on top of you and trying to move, like that's how beat up I was. But somehow, just focusing on the next furthest distance we could see, the next mile, my dad, like you know, being a incredibly positive support team. And, uh, you know, we managed to make it through those extremely difficult points to get back on track. But, you know, ultimately we finished the eighth fastest time, uh, you know, you with, know, with that endeavor. The intro to um, Like Harvey, Like Son, there's a moment in there where your dad says, oh, we're going to finish the race. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad he had that sort of faith. You know, you, sometimes he, he, my dad used to be like thinking, son, this is not a good idea, this ultra running. I mean, I mean, I, I, I can't tell you how many times he told me that back in the 90s. He's like, you're going to ruin your knees and there's going to be all kinds of issues and, you know, uh, with with that. And uh, th- this just isn't healthy. He didn't but, learn. So I don't have any children, do you? I, I do have a son. Okay, yeah. so so I don't. But so here's what parents need to learn. I can speak to this because I was a kid. They need to know that what they tell you to do, <laughs> you're not going to. Right. And what they tell you not to do, you're going to. And so, I don't know if I said that right, but he should have said, I think this is the best thing ever. <laughs> I think you should go run 100 miles today. It's easy. You may never have been an ultra marathon. I mean, truly, you're you're absolutely right, and that that's another thing because you know it's like it's interesting the psychology because you know you have on one end, you know the motivation of having, you know, some people in your life that have somehow impacted you and and given you extra like wind in your sails, but then on the other hand, you could have like the individual that tells you it's not possible, you can't do that. And you know what? I mean, I draw on probably even more motivation when someone tells me I can't do something than someone telling me you can do something. See? And it's it's so true. It is absolutely – I love that. I love when someone tells me you can't do that 
It's like um, the most, one of the most powerful things out there. Why don't we learn that, though, too? Because that's yeah. always the people that want to see you fall that say that. Oh, yeah. So many of them are. And I'm not saying that parents aren't trying to look out for us. But it's like, hey, if you really want someone to fall, do not challenge that person. Because you might wake up a beast inside of someone. You don't want that. I, I say to people so often, I'm like, I, I like to be underestimated. I do. Yeah. It does something special for me. Yeah, it's. A, I love it. I do. I love I, that. Underestimate. I me. love it. Yeah. And so why do you like it? Well, I've, I've always been that role. I've always been the underdog yeah. until like the last like couple years. <laughs> so how's it working now since you're not the underdog? You were well, number five. So like, here yeah, comes I know. number yeah, five. Yeah, yeah. It, it's... You know, it, it makes it like, for example, this last backyard ultra, it, it is tougher coming in as a number one seated runner. You know, it, it is, it, there's an expectation of performance. The pressure. There's there. like, uh, all eyes are, you're the target. You know, there, there's, yeah, so there is a, 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 a level of pressure with that, but that's, it can be fun too. It can be. You know, it, so, so I guess guys like Harvey, um, I don't have to have you on my team, but I probably don't want to go against the team that you're on. Yeah, you don't want to be against. You don't want to be against me. If you're on the sidelines, it's okay. You don't want to be against my team. Man. I can tell like, that. Yeah, we. we I think uh, most of the teams I've been on in the last few goes that have have won all out. Yeah, and, and I might not be the strongest guy on the team, but it's like I may. In fact, like right now, uh, it's kind of a one of the things that's been. In my my background is a 24 hour race, so we went back to fans. What I told you about in the beginning that that race I ran first time back in 1996. So right now, I'm like uh, I've been on the USA uh, national team for the World Championship like longer than any of the men and women, and it's like more than 12 years now. Uh, we had a couple races that were canceled over the years, but I've been on it five times, and the next one's gonna be in Taipei next december and uh right now i'm listed as number five on the team i'm i may end up being on the team i'm gonna give everything i can get to get on that team just like with the the uh bigs backyard ultra championship but i may not be the person that has the furthest distance on that team but i'm gonna help everyone on the team to to be the best they can be too like I really believe I, I, I can have a positive influence on them. You know, it's like what I what we talk about before the race even starts. And then ha coming together as a as a team where it's like I want everyone on that team to be successful. It's not like my goal to beat them. My goal is like to do my role, but my goal is for them to, to be their best. And you know, it's the same in in, in my classroom too. You know, it's like I want every – last quarter was special. Like it was the first time in my teaching career where I didn't have a single F in any of my students. And I was like, that was amazing. Good thing you weren't yeah. one of the students. I know, I know, I know. It's true. Yeah, that, that was, it's, that's true. <laughs> but it was that's special, true. so the first yeah. time ever. First time ever I didn't have a single student with an F. And, um, I mean, like – Why is it important for you to excel? I just feel like we only have one life. Like that's one big thing for me. It's like I see like, for me, it's like I don't. I don't want to go like medi mediocre on things. I want to like give everything I have. Like it's like I want it to sail as far as possible. Like we 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 got this beautiful thing, this beautiful life, and it's like it's it's so fleeting. Like I see my mom, my dad, my stepmother, and it's like I'm trying to like. I go to my mom's twice, three times a week now, and, and we do our thing. I take care of, like, the groceries and stuff like that. But it's, it's like I try to, like, savor these moments because those mean more to me than any amount of money. It's like the, the relationships we build in this world and the life experiences. I mean, you need, like, the finances to have financial freedom that's is have the base to have your needs met but it's like those relationships and, and life experiences are the treasures and they can't be taken away <laughs> like i mean they can be you know at some point my parents are going to die you know and it's it, it, and i've been so blessed to have them this long in life 
but you know the the life experiences we shared together and i i feel like you know they'll they're gonna be there as long as i'm alive so you know the, yeah paying it forward man i think um because it's more on my mind all the time and i don't think i think we were mistaken that i don't think it comes with age necessarily the older we get the closer to death that we get for me it's experience like that's what i think about what you just articulated you wouldn't have articulated that at 25 i don't think you might have felt some semblance of it but not that right not the experiences with your mom and dad the importance of those moments i don't know maybe you did did you you know i I probably wouldn't have been able to articulate it in you know, I, I think, yeah, it's it comes with the experience. But it's special. Know, yeah. and, and I think maybe that's what, what I realize is it doesn't matter how many hours I put into work. You put just as much into running. Yeah, it's 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 kind of a crazy thing. I it, You know, if, if I think about, like, comparative, like, uh, comparing to, like, other countries, like you hear about in China or – japan like the work ethic and and like yeah it's it's something something impressive but yeah there's i put a lot of energy into like my my day like i mean i'm i pretty much from the moment i get up i may i don't watch i don't have a tv in my like on the weekdays i don't have a tv in my home uh on the weekdays i, I pretty much go like run to work work all the day and then run home then I might go uh, to my mom's. Then I go run again. <laughs> so, you know, it's like a lot of times I'm going. I don't, I don't need my my condo. I I should just get a, a tiny house. Like I don't even use the place. I I use the kitchen and my bedroom. And that's it. And I'm usually only there from like 10 p.m. to like 7 a.m. Like that's it. And I'm I'm like when I'm there, I'm like doing laundry, doing boom, boom, boom. It's like that's. And then when it's the weekend, that's when I have more time with my fiance, mm-hmm. and uh, but I'm also going out in the woods, and you know we train for like this crazy race we didn't talk about yet, Barkley. <laughs> Let's go. Oh yeah, so yeah, Barkley was the the it is it is it is the the animal of craziness. I mean, it, it's just such a crazy race because you have like 120 miles where you have to run in 60 hours and you have to like run 60 percent of it off trail on extremely steep like inclines and you climb the equivalent of mount everest from sea level to top twice in 60 hours and you have to while you're doing this this the character i was telling you about laz you have to basically uh find these books he's hidden in the wilderness so this all happens down in tennessee only four and a half hour drive from cincinnati four hour drive from cincinnati and uh the frozen head state park and it's uh it's like um really difficult to do the navigating when it's dark foggy rainy and 32 degrees (laughs) it's really difficult it's wet uh well, yeah, as yeah. for the records a terrible human being uh, yeah for the record oh no him no. hiding books <laughs> so as i wanted you back into your story but you do realize what you've just told us that 120 miles right so well said, it's supposed to be a 100 mile race but we, but but everyone knows it's really like 125 miles like there's no exact measurements because in every year it kind of evolves and he's always trying to make it slightly tougher He's a Whatever. horrible human being. Oh, yes. yeah. yeah. He's, he's, a hundred, he's a genius. 125 miles in 60 hours. Okay. You know that's two and a half days, right? I'm just making yeah. sure that you yeah, know what I you're doing I guess it's here. about two and a half days. I'll, yeah, it, it seems like a lifetime. <laughs> it's more like a lifetime. You guys are – okay, so get back into Laz. I just want to establish for the record that I think he's a horrible human being. <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 he creates the venues for, for ordinary people to do – really extraordinary thing so it's called barkley barkley yeah barkley. it's named after one of his neighbors okay yeah he's a good friend all right so uh, these books to navigate it's really tough well yeah the books he he chooses the books based on his humor of the year 
So like, I mean, they usually have titles like you're going to die or hell is real or just give up. <laughs> like he finds these really funny titles. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and, and then you got to go, what you got to do is you got to follow his directions, which are really cryptic. And I mean, each like, I mean, book has like a paragraph you got to follow. So you got to go like, all right, go northeast up the re-entrance find the uh beech tree that seems bigger than all the others and the book will be underneath the roots of that beech tree <laughs> there's like 20 beech trees <laughs> so it sometimes it can be a little challenging especially if you're a virgin like it's your first year doing it and last year was my first year running this sparkly race it's definitely mo the most difficult race on the planet no doubt about it it's it's uh no one has finished it in the last five years and since 1984 only 15 people have finished the race so it's it, but it it the thing is it's just right on the cusp of what is possible for a human being to do maybe you know so it's like it's possible and we and it's like you 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 think it's possible but it's, it's like you have to have everything come together like a, just perfectly in a crescendo to make it actually ever come true. It would be like the scene of Indiana Jones where he's literally roaring underneath the door and a door slams, you know, that, that trap door slams shut. And that's the way it will be the next time someone finishes Barkley. So no one ever quits. It's just how far do you get within the 60 hours? Oh, no, a lot of people quit. They, they, get, they get scared <laughs> and they get tired they get cold they get sick a lot of people quit most people quit but yet yeah, there are a lot of people that they just get timed out so what happened to you last year uh, well it was kind of uh i guess i quit uh oh i did quit so it's kind of like a a, a quit um so what did you learn then what you what, learn what happened was i was halfway through loop number two loop no number one was when went well um loop number two i we we couldn't find a book it was like the the sixth book we we six or seven book uh it was raining pure dark uh our visibility was down to like maybe like seven or eight feet i mean it was just raining really hard 32 degrees and uh courtney uh dualter who's just uh an amazing runner and herself uh you took number two to her in a race. I did. She's she is she has been the number one female ultra runner of the year, numerous years, and and she's by far the most famous ultra runner in America. Maybe David Goggins and her might be pretty like he might have her slightly on that one, but she's amongst the ultra running world. She is like the she is definitely like um, just an amazing person, and 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 what you see from her on social media is exactly the way she is in person. Like, I mean, she's, it's not like you get two different characters. Like she is as sincere as she can be yeah. when no one's watching and it's somebody that, yeah. I mean, she is like just a really good, good, amazing person. But yeah, she beat me at, at Biggs in 2020. Mm -hmm. I was number two with her. And um, yeah, we've been on the same team together for the 24 hour race. Anytime I'm on the team with Courtney, it's like it's like definitely an amazing experience. She's she's just a a very supportive person. It's not like she's com extremely competitive, but with her extremely competitive nature, it's not like she's trying to tear down the person next to her. She, it's like she she makes other people greater as well. Isn't it good when you have a team event and there's that person who shows up and you're like, oh, we got a shot. Yeah, yeah. Because of uh, them, we got a shot. Me, what, them. Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, we we've had pretty uh, amazing teams in America, like uh, in terms of world championships in the running category for many years. So you guys quit because you couldn't find a book. Hard. I know. It's, uh, it sounds pathetic. <laughs> I know. Well, you know, we we just like we were getting really cold, and. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was just like to when you it's not like there's some beacon on you and it's not like any sort of no one's coming to rescue you out there. So, I mean, 
anything happens, you have to be, you're responsible for yourself. Like no one knows where you are exactly. I mean, they could like figure out like based on like the last book's uh, page torn, but that that's could take like 10 hours to figure out where the heck roughly someone is and then narrow it down from there. So yeah, we, we ended up like saying like, okay, we were out there for quite a while, like maybe a half hour, an hour, like I think an hour searching for that book. And it, we just were unable to find it in our, in a time was passing and we're just getting, when you slow down and it's 32 degrees, I mean, it's really interesting when you're running in the rain. Like I, I like when it rains, like I like when it's cold and it rains, but when it's cold and it rains and you're out there for a couple hours and you got like your equipment on, it's, that's cool. Then you're out there for like five or six hours. Okay. And then go out there for like 10 hours and see how you feel. Like, it's like, you might as well just be swimming in a lake. That's, you know, 32 degrees because it feels about the same if you're, if you're, you know, yeah. So I learned a lot from that experience. And I also felt like in that circumstance, I wasn't just responsible for myself. It was like Courtney and I, and you know, so if, we were both pretty cold. I knew I was cold and I knew she was wearing slightly less than I was. So I knew she must be at least as cold as me and if not more cold. So, I mean, getting from there to getting out, if anything happened to either one of us, like then that would be, I didn't want her to be responsible for me. And also it would be hard for me to, to get both of us out if, if something happened to her. So, and I mean, you're dealing with a lot of like, crazy exposure i mean you got like we got creeks were crossing you got rocks are slippery i mean there's a lot of obstacles out there so that day i said okay this barkley thing is new to me and like this i'm i'm gonna like take these lessons i'm a you know we're gonna hike it back to camp which was not easy <laughs> we had to climb up a, a a steep like uh Jeez, uh, it's steep hillside. I, th I think they call it meat grinder. I'm not sure if that's the name of that one, but um, yeah, I mean, it it took us like all three or four hours to get back, it seemed. And uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't regret that because it was a learning experience. And uh, you know, it's kind of like Fight Club out there. We don't actually say if we're if we're doing the race again or this or that. But yeah, I'm gonna do that race again. I'm not telling you when, <laughs> but I'm gonna do that race again. And uh, I, I hope to take those lessons. And, you know, it's kind of great to fail at something too, you know, because failing makes you better if you don't give up. So how do we know when to quit? How do we know? So the, for me, it depends on the situation, of course. But, like, definitely with running, the only time I would quit is if I actually had, like, something that I was potentially injuring that would impact me long term. Yeah, that's the only time I'll quit. Or, and you know, in the case of Barkley, you know, I felt like you know, we were putting ourselves in a, in a circumstance that they, it could be bad. Like, you know, I mean, those, those situations could turn bad. They could, fast. and they do yeah. for people. Yeah, if you, if you know what you're doing, you know when it could be yeah. okay. And so the only reason why it's okay to quit is if you learn from it and you come back again. Bam. So those... Um, so let's go back uh, to wrap this up so I don't keep you all night because you have more running to do. I got more running. I got to go get some food. <laughs> you get some good. We're going to go get him some lettuce. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm going to go get down there to that Kung Fu China place maybe on the way back and get some of that hot. Kung like, Fu Amerasia. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. <gasps> right down on Madison and come yeah, and take Yeah, they got some amazing. Like, yeah, so some why food. do we just have to talk about how amazing Ohio is? Yeah, no, I love North Kentucky. I love it. Okay, I love the sure. the uh, architecture over here, like the, the, the character. The Italian stuff. And yeah. Oh, yeah, I love a lot of the food spots. I mean, I'm okay. all about the food. Just make sure. Riverside Restaurant right there. Just had to check that. Yeah, he's awesome, man. Oh, yeah. He's all, he just opened the new place, too, the Chai Chai. It's a... Um, Chicken place. Okay. I'm gonna say it wrong, but it's a Korean right. pronunciation. But it's on Madison as well. Okay. Um. Yeah, he's an awesome guy. Yeah. Um. So going back to this 25 year journey you've been on with running, and because I'm always trying to learn lessons, I'm trying to grow from the people that are around me. Um. That process of learning and growing and developing in this evolution of your mind, because we talked about. Could you have connected this purpose of life when you were 25? Could you have articulated it the same way as you can now? Um, 
Because we are going to die. I'm not a morbid guy, but that's the facts. Unless Elon comes up <laughs> with, with the special pill, baby. <laughs> yeah. Unless he does. I don't even know if I'd want to take it, though. I don't know. Yeah. Because it's like, what, am I halting life now? Am I halting it when I'm your friend who's 101? Mm. Right? So when am I halting? Do I get to go back when I'm 30, but with this brain now? Um, how can... Because I think you've gotten to a place at 46 where you have a shot to make the next segment of your life real special. I do. Because of where your mind's at. The limitations that you've unshackled this brain and this human life and these thoughts that we have. That feels like unshackled. The Harvey sitting in front of me seems to believe he can do anything. I want everyone to get there. I don't know if I'm quite there, but I'm close. But I want everyone to get there. But it was such a long journey for you. All the adversity in life, the ADHD stuff, the eating all that Taco Bell that we talked about, um, making the decision to run the first marathon, finishing it in way more time than you thought those eight-minute miles were going to be, getting into a terrible car wreck and having surgery and could have been paralyzed, um, to moments where you don't finish races and you finish second, and I'm sure at probably adversity as a teacher at times, but you kept going. And the Harvey that sits in front of me today that's accomplished everything you have, you couldn't have been that same guy if you wouldn't have kept going, keep compounding the learning, keep compounding the growth. Not everyone is as resilient as you are, man. They're not. And what is the special sauce? I don't know if it's just one thing, man, but what's the special sauce to give advice? You're an educator, mm, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Why is it important to have belief, to have faith, to keep going, to know there's something better that you can't even see yet? Hmm. Yeah, it's like uh, there's like a formula to it, I, you know? There's like a formula to it. So, I mean, there's definitely the, you know, uh, everything has to come from like a growth perspective like that you're just hungry you know you're like hungry for whatever you can get whatever it is it doesn't matter you know what i mean like i had three students recently do career project and they want to be professional basketball players and i was like okay well you know i i, I love i love these guys number one but i was like i want to talk to you guys after class and i'm like it's not, I don't want to like diminish anyone's dreams, period. Like I, 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 I still have this belief that like, okay, if you really, really, really want to do this, then anything is possible. So I'm trying to figure out if this is something you really want to do. Because I'm telling you, I told those guys, I said, look, we had a little private meeting. I said, if you really want to do that, then you've got to do things totally differently than you are right now. And I don't know you guys really want to do that. If that's cool, if you don't want to do that, that's fine. Because not everyone wants to, and I know it's extremely competitive. But if you really want to do that, like, you've got to start doing things that no one else does. Like, I mean, and that's, like, for for what I've experienced, like, that's part of what it is. Like, I mean, for me, it's like I, I don't follow other people. I do my own thing, too. I learn from other people. But I do a lot of crazy weird stuff <laughs> you know yes sunday i was running with rocks <laughs> like in my hands you know what i mean it's like i run with my backpack back and forth to work every day you know it's like i chase the i i race the bus on the way to work i love racing the bus <laughs> i love it <laughs> and, and i just I, I i do that because it's like once about once every you know once every um maybe once every six months i actually beat the bus and like it's like I love the reaction of those people on that bus. <laughs> I look out the window and they're like, "That man, what is this going on?" <laughs> it's just the funniest sight. Like they're like, "What the?" I want to use a, "What just happened? How did he do that?" <laughs> so I mean, I love that. That's like so much fun. But it it you know it doesn't matter if I come in last in the race. I almost came in last in the race this year and, and did something totally new. It was uh, the Leadville 100 race. And I didn't know. I was like, okay, I, I've got this mindset that hey, I do anything. Just 
give it to me. I'll go and, and I'm going to get it. Well, you know, I'm coming from Cincinnati, which is like 490 feet above sea level. And Leadville is at 10,200 feet. It's like the tallest city in America. And I'm like, this race averages uh, over 10,000 feet. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll just like get off work on Thursday. I'll get on the flight. No problem. I'm going to get there. Uh, you know, I'll take one day off work Friday and I'll do the race. No problem. So, yeah, I start the race 40 miles into it. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing pretty. It's about where I want to be. Like, you know, I'm, I'm in like range of like hitting top five to top 10. That's exactly where I want to be. Well, yeah, I get to the, 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 the big mountain push mile 40 plus. And I was like, it just felt like I hit like kryptonite or something. Like it, it, it's just that elevation. It hasn't impacted me like that before. And it didn't entirely wipe me out, but it, it pushed me way back. And I, and I ran too fast in the beginning. So, I mean, adapting to that by li like uh, moving or going to that, that race and, and staying there to acclimate like eight to 10 days beforehand would be just an incredible difference. Uh, and you know, I struggled, I ended up like finishing the race, I think with about an hour and 20 minutes ago. And you know, it, it, it I was like 200 and something out of the race, but, uh, you know, that, that was also really fun. Even though I was like nearly the last person to finish, I had a lot of fun with the, the crew I was with. I had a lot of fun with like the sights. Like, I mean, it was beautiful coming up over Hope Pass. And like just learning, like the learning, I was like, just, it was like, you're in the matrix and you're just sucking it in. Like just seeing, okay, like learning the impact of like the elevation truly. Cause I've run a lot of races that you go up like Badwater. I went up to 14.5 in to, to, um, in, in chasing, getting the record of the fastest known time from the lowest to highest place in the 48 States. But I wasn't up there the whole duration, you know, it's just like four hours up and then sometime take your time going back down. But like, yeah, being at that elevation, it was a real, and, and so, yeah, it was, so you couldn't do the same thing. You couldn't do it. But so, that's okay. It was, yeah. like, it was, a, it was fun in a way. Some sort of masochistic way. You got checked a little bit. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. oh, okay. Well, maybe Harvey's not all that, huh? Right, right. But that's okay. It's all right. So you why know? is it important to tell those three boys though? Because the fact is, there are only something like um, 200 NBA players or something that are Absolutely. right. And so, why is it important that we can't do what everybody else is doing? Why is it important? Why do we have to do different things? Why? Yeah, it's it's just the because we don't want to. Yeah, it's it's like, I mean, for certain things, if you want to be president of the United States, you've got to like be relentless. I mean, and and. Uh, I mean, it's just you have to have like a, a, un, a, a unprecedented, relentless spirit. And for certain areas like basketball, if you want to be an NBA player, some people are extremely gifted. And, that, and that's, awesome. that's awesome if you have that sort of talent. But, I mean, uh, you know, for a lot of us, we we didn't get to where we are based on that talent. Mm -hmm. I mean, no way. Like I was picked like usually last in, in, in most of the sports in, in high school, and you know that's it, it's it's kind of it's kind of really funny when I when I come across someone I, I went to high school with, or middle school even. Like I mean, because they're like, what what happened to you? How did this even occur? <laughs> like what happened? There's no way we would ever dream. Okay. She would still be doing this. All right, so here's the thing. So what happened? You know, it, it was not a single thing. It was a long train of, like, events that, from my experience, that led me to this moment. You know what I mean? It was the, my mom having that stroke and, like, changing my, my lifestyle in terms of, like, my nutrition to eating plant-based. That's huge. It was having that car wreck. I mean, I, I'm grateful that I had that car wreck. That seems like the most ridiculous thing to say. I am so thankful that I had that car wreck. I am so thankful I had that car wreck because that car wreck, uh, it, it, it like changed my life in so many ways. You know, um, I'm grateful for the, the students I've had in my classroom. 
I mean, because that experience of being a teacher and having the opportunity to have those relationships with young people has kept me young and like kept me learning. So, I mean, it's like we all have these encounters and it's what we do with them. I mean, you could be in a waiting room. Like I was in a, you could be in a waiting room and you could talk to the person next to you. And like, I'm always amazed by like all the connections you can make with people. You know, it's like, it's huge. So, I mean, you could just sit there and like doodle on your phone or thoughts. And sometimes that's nice too, but you know, I, I'm always amazed by like, you know, the, the connection with people. And, and I feel like, you know, it's not like a single thing. It's been a, a long train, but you know, we do have some control in this life and we do make those choices at every angle, which way we're going to go. And it's like that, like cliche, like quote that we, you know, I love is, you know, it's the road less taken, you know, it's like, it's critical, the road less taken, you know, it's like, being, What's so special about that, about the road less taken? Because you're making an argument that we should take that road. It's it's life. I mean, it's like the the power of following our intuition of what we as is, is individuals like, not just the the mode of society or the mode of culture. Because those there's oftentimes. You know, treme- there's tremendous energies pushing against us to go a certain grain. All the all the time. Yeah, you know, all the time. When we may feel like that, there's something that I- I- internally that is it, it, it's not feeling the right direction. Here's you know? what's all, here's here's what's awesome about that. Um, the few things I've learned in life. There's one big one that I've really started to understand over the past five years. Any of us, I don't care if there's two people that listen to this podcast other than the four in this room. Every one of us have had people in our lives that have doubted us and they have been naysayers. I don't care what level of thing we're shooting for. There have been naysayers. But look for the ones who aren't doing that to you. And I guarantee they're the ones you should listen to. Because what I have found in life, the only people that are questioning what you're doing or trying to deter you from going after your hopes and dreams are people who didn't chase theirs. Every time. Mm. Every single time, man. And and that's not just a quote. That's not something just to be said. I have learned that. And there's there's not many of them. Right? If you look around in your life, there's not many people that say, "Hey, just keep going." That don't say, "Hey, you know, steer clear of that it's going to be too hard." Man, those people that cuz I know that's what you are for your students. I guarantee you it's what you did with those three boys. You pulled them aside and they said, hey, guys, listen, this is serious talk. Like, I just need you to know how hard it's going to be. If you're going to start down this path, because the extra stuff you told them to do was, you didn't say don't do it, but you know what they need to do? They need to stay late after practice. They got to shoot a 1,000 free throws. And that's what I told them. Right? <laughs> I, I said that. I said, you got like, to invest like – 10,000 hours you have to put in more time than anybody around you is exactly. putting exactly that's essential period and so anybody who's gotten there understands whether it's running whether it's real estate whether it's playing basketball whether it's being the best nurse at a hospital whether it's being the best librarian if the best producer of a podcast the more you do it the more you're going to learn the more you're going to learn the better outcome you're going to have and it's going to put you in a spot in life where you actually control your outcome those things that we can control and so Try to search out and find the people in life that say, hey, man, just keep going. Like, I, I don't know what the outcome's going to be because there's some uncontrollables, but you can do it. Man, I, I just wish there were more of us in life that were that. But don't pay attention to the naysayers because those people, have, they haven't done a damn thing, man. They haven't done anything anywhere near the dreams and the hopes you have for your life. They just haven't. But it's, I mean, honestly, I, I love when people – are the naysayers and and say you can't do this because that that just fires me up more and i mean i think about one of my friends growing up uh adam you know he he had some high school teacher teachers that told him like he he just couldn't do it and he ultimately i believe got his gd like he ended up not finishing with our class but he's gone on to get his master's degree and, and working on you know, a PhD, like, and it's like, 
That's right, Adam. <laughs> Do you remember that? So, I mean, it's like I, I'm very careful with what I say to students. I, I really try not to ever say anything. I don't want to, like, prop them up and, like, like, I also don't want them to fail. So I'm gonna, I tell them when they did a lousy presentation. And I've said that. I've said that the last couple of weeks. But at the same time, I'm conscientious about what I'm saying because I don't want to, like, yeah. But sometimes it's helpful for people to hear that. 100%. You know, it's helpful to hear that. Aren't you always giving the message like, hey, that's a bad presentation, but if you want to get a better one, if you want to do a better one, let me show you how. Yeah. Right. Period. Yeah, that's like, right. Pay attention to the instruction I've given you. The reason why you don't you didn't have a good presentation is because you didn't do X, Y, Z. And I told you that. Now you've learned. Now, if you want to give a good one, if you want to overcome, then do the things I taught you. There's nothing wrong with that, right? The problem is, is when people told you, like, well, yeah, I told you. Yeah, you weren't going to be able to do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just, so bad. just stay where you're at in life. And listen, there's teachers like that, too. Yeah, you're right. There you're are. Right. Yeah, you're right. right. Definitely, definitely. So look look for the people that are propping you up. And, and I'd say look for the Harveys, not the Harvey the runner, Harvey even the teacher and educator, because you need somebody to give you the real honest truth about life. Like, listen, listen to someone who's been through it, who's willing to share what it's going to take and what the long journey and what the marathon looks like. Look for the guy who's willing to even run the ultra marathon. <laughs> Thank you. That guy's got good stuff for you. He's nuts. <laughs> a little nuts, maybe. Yeah, a <laughs> he's little a little bit. crazy, right? Yeah. Well, they love the. You know, we do our plank sessions. You know, um, we have our Jeopardy games, like the physical challenges thrown in there, and have our our vegan vegetarian club. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I don't want good. you. I don't want you to be my. Uh, I don't want you to be the coach that leads my challenges. I have to do. I don't want you to be. <laughs> no, you do. Yeah, no, no, I know. I, I right now don't. Oh yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. <laughs> no, do. I was actually thinking maybe we could do some planks in the, yeah. the podcast. So, yeah, so, so here's the thing. So no, we're gonna. Good. I'm gonna steal. We're gonna wrap this up, man. And then we'll spend ten or fifteen minutes in the content studio because I got a couple of things I want to drop on you. Um, I'll ask you over there things like, oh, why should I do planks, or um, why do you think yoga is good for me, or I'm the least. Um, I don't know. I'm the least. If you saw me, man, I'm like that hardened rubber band that uh, doesn't have any elasticity left in it. Man, you don't, you don't have zero flexibility. I have zero. That's me too. I have How zero. about that? I have we, zero. we have that in common as well. Would you? I can't say it now. The what we used to call it when you would sit when your knees would you know you cross your knees. Okay. We used to call yeah, it something yeah, else, yeah, right? Yeah, but yeah, yeah. My knees are like straight up, man. Right, right, right. Try to push them down. You're gonna crack. Yeah. Bones in my body and joints yeah. are gonna tear apart. Right. That's me. Right. Okay, I'm just letting yeah, you know. Yeah, I know. I, I'm the same way. I, I'm not flexible. In fact, a uh, fellow that lives in northern Kentucky, he's an amazing uh, sports massage guy, uh, guy Ian, uh, Ian Hughes. He said, Harvey, you are the second least flexible person I've ever worked on next to a lady in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> what's that what's that supposed to be next to the lady in scotland Wait, he's from words? scotland but he's like okay. yeah i found one other person that's less flexible than you but she lives over in the uk so like you're the least flexible person i've ever worked on in 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 north america so you're number one at two things yeah how about that yeah right. top five in ultra marathons and number one least flexible, <laughs> least flexible. Right. um hey man i don't know if you have any parting shots um just about life and running and people and optimism but i appreciate you man for um, for meeting you and just seeing how optimistic, Thank how you. how generous you are with your time, um, the approach and the perspective you have on life. Thank you very much. I it, really appreciate it. It's refreshing. And man. likewise, it's it's fun to have a chance to talk with you and and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing some more of your podcasts. We're gonna take this thing to the top. I I believe it. I believe it. Okay. I mean that's that's uh, there there is a demand out there for for some great content i mean there's there's some really good podcasts out there but there's some need for for some great ones we uh, i just want to learn i want to grow selfishly and i know that if i'm learning uh, there's a lot of other people that can listen and learn too and so um i'm excited to keep growing man so yeah we're gonna take this thing to the top whatever so we're like an ultra marathon of podcasters see i love that we ain't stopping baby bam we take we're, we're gonna going. take some l's i'm gonna be pissed when we lose we're gonna be we're not gonna quit that's right, right. That's right. I, that day, there's going to be some day when we lose the recording. Mm. That's going to hurt. Mm. Hopefully it's not this moment. <laughs> but that's going to happen. And um, I know it's going to happen, and I've prepared myself for those moments. And yeah. you say, okay, that sucks. Let's right. not ever let it happen again. What do we do now? Mm-hmm. I'm excited. I'm excited mm. for 2023. Mm. So yeah, you said right. 22 has been a good year. Right. 
What is Harvey going to accomplish in 2023 as we wrap this thing up? Well, you know, honestly, one of the things I, that's also I love to do every year is I like to, like, write down goals. So I, I write down a list of usually 10 to 12 goals. And, I mean, it really, to me, it, it, I love it. Like, I, I usually make goals that are, like, personal goals. So something with my relationship with my partner, uh, with Kelly and I. And uh, also, like, you maybe two there. I make uh, something with running. I mean, something with my parents, my son. Uh, I mix it up, one with teaching. And uh, that I, I feel like those are those are so important. But I'm gonna go for for running since we've been talking about running. I'm definitely gonna go for like winning the world championship of backyard ultras again. So that's 2023. It's gonna have 75 of the top like runners in the world, like all people that have won backyard ultras in their own country. So these this is a real hardened group of people. I mean, and most everyone wants to win at this point. So for me to win, I have to do something I've never done before. I'm not exactly sure what that is yet, but I'll let you know afterwards. <laughs> you know what you could do? Have you ever done any fundraising around a race? Yeah, 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 lots of times, like different in, in what's, times. What's the most that you've ever raised? Uh, we, we raise for the uh, uh, gospel mission in uh cincinnati uh we we raised like over it was over like ten thousand dollars when we did the uh run from the lowest to highest point the uh 146 the bad war 146 and uh yeah, city gospel mission and like that that definitely that's a good point is uh because i was i was driven in that because like we talked about like not just my personal you know i definitely want to do well but when you know, I'm, I'm running along the journey and, and, uh, you know, my friend tells me, oh yeah, we've, we've already raised $5,000 and like, you know, people are seeing this, that motivated me more to, to try to get that goal. So since we can accomplish anything we can put our minds to, let me throw something out about a fundraising perspective that Harvey could have. That's serious. What about if you go out to the partners in Cincinnati and around and say, hey, I don't want you to give me money just to run the race because I'm already, I was already number one. What happens if I finish number one? Maybe a goal of $100,000. If you finish number one to get commitments from people in the community that they will fund $100,000 to the nonprofit of your choice if you win. That'd be pretty incredible. I might die because <laughs> I won't give up. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that'd be that'd be quite extraordinary. Absolutely. You need to put together a team to do it because yeah. I think that from who you are, um, I think you give every ounce of everything you've got mm. to give a hundred grand back to that community. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I don't know how to do it, man, but I'm yeah, just telling you hey, that might there, be that something. Is, that's super powerful. Yeah. I'll leave it in my, uh, you know, book of uh, Ideas. tricks. <laughs> yeah. All right, man. I'm just saying. No, they, no, they... no. I'm not saying no to it. I, I do like the idea. Uh, it's, it's possible. I'll give you five grand. Oh, you will? It, it, if just, you win. If I win. Well, that's huge. Five towards, grand. Five grand or whatever. To, towards a charity, yeah, and local that charity. Choose. That's huge. Wow. Thank you. Oh, well, I... I mean, I will accept that, like, on behalf of the charity. And, geez, that's, that's super powerful. So if I'm willing to do that. Yeah. I guarantee there's another 19 people in this community that will make the same commitment. That's amazing. Right. That's, 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 ex that's beautiful, extraordinary. And, uh, wow, that's, that's amazing. Let's go, yeah. baby. Number one. Well, we should think about, since you in initiated this, mm -hmm. what, what group we would we would we'll do this for. I could come up with another five or six just myself, man. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but what charity were you guys what do you think? I don't know. We I mean, you know, the Brighton Center is really passionate to us in northern Kentucky. Mm-hmm. Um, we do a lot of volunteer work for them. I don't know if you've heard of them or not. No. Um, I was just down the other day and um we've done build a beds for kids in the community that don't have a bed. Okay. Um uh, a few years ago we um 
built beds. We went into the home, put the bed together. Um, that's been the most um, impactful thing for me because there's these basic things in life that even though I was poor, I did still have a bed. Oh, yeah. Had a roof over my head. Um, Man, I, I love that. That's so right? wild that you, you, you guys are doing well, this. Well, we didn't come up with the idea. Yeah. They, they just – this is something they do. And so – I'll just share my experience about what we did. It was pre-COVID, so they shut it down during COVID because going to people's homes. And But um, we raised the money for the bedding, for like mm. 100 beds for bedding. But the fascinating thing to me was I went and there was a house in Newport, and we actually um, we fabricated the beds on site at Gateway in Covington, and we took them back apart, put them in trucks with mattresses and we had the addresses and the name of the family and who so we went to these homes didn't meet them before but you go in the kids are there man and so we go in and some of these houses i mean you know it's places that you're just like man you're living here this is where you live Mm. and you go in i didn't feel this with every one of them but there's a couple that the kids are giddy man they're pumped yeah i don't know if they don't know that their wife's challenging but they're pumped but then what, what I know is, man, this was like Christmas for them. Hmm. They knew that day they were getting a bed. And what I found was for the first time in their life. Hmm. And there was a kid that we put together this bed, put it together. Um, we're making the bed. We're putting the sheets and put the – He's, it's like he's trying to open the gift on Christmas Day. Hmm. The moment that we put the comforter on the bed, he jumps in. Hmm. He jumps into bed, he pulls the blanket up, and I'm sitting there talking to him. I don't know what to say. I'm a guy who's got something to say all the time. And he said, thank you. He said, it's the first time I've ever had my own bed. Mm. And so the Brighton Center does all sorts of things in northern Kentucky. Well, I'm uh, 100% in on that. They're awesome, man. They have yeah. food pantries. Uh, the I other, love that. The other day we, um, uh, we helped uh, wrap gifts and take parents shopping in the, a place for toys where parents didn't have enough money to give toys for christmas Mm. and so they'd come through and we'd help them go shopping and then a lot of our agents worked in the food pantry where people would come in and man these people are coming in for christmas dinner food man and so uh it's a significant organization also they fund they try to really get people to to improve the place they're at in life and they'll take them through financial assistance classes teaching Mm. them how to manage their finances how do you collect money for a down payment on a house they'll offer a grant and so we've been trying to fund some money for grants to buy their first home. Wow. So the Brighton Center in Northern Kentucky is awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm 100% in. Okay. 100%. And, and I don't know what lads are going to think of this whole crazy angle, but that's going to be sweet. And uh, I just don't want to let you guys down. I'll, However, <laughs> I'm going to give everything I got to make this happen. Okay. So yeah. I need so some I, I, I'm just going to give it all I got. So that's all I can do. So but, I'll find another five or six people. Okay, so we'll have pivot, give five K, but you gotta win. Yeah, yeah, I've gotta win. You gotta win. And uh, you know, we might get some help from some other folks on this one. So yeah. I'll find I'll find five or six. I'll find twenty five or thirty incredible. grand. Incredible. Okay. Man, that that is absolutely that's that's probably about one of the wildest things that ever happened on podcasts for me. Let's go, baby. <laughs> I'm serious. I'll be it'll Seriously. it'll it'll be um I mean, no, the, I mean, it's like it, it's 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 such a, a incredible, like generous thought. You be the have. best five thousand dollars I've ever spent in my life because there's no better feeling that I personally give um, than really trying to give back and change other people's lives. It's the most special things I ever feel. Yeah, it's, right. It's mm. no pressure, baby. Hey, no, so no, when no is pressure. this? When's the race? Well, you, we we got a little time to do the fundraising because it's uh, not until October, mid October of twenty three. And it's going to be a big deal. Like, we're going to go for this. And, uh, wow, that's going to be something magical, man. $100,000. Yeah. That's, that's, I'm woo, confident. Here's the thing. That's, I, that's I, over, that, hey, I don't mind. I think that's some good pressure there. <laughs> I have, here's, I have no Ooh. doubt that we can come up with this. Yeah. I have no doubt. I'm going to have to really work on my sleeping. <laughs> All right, man. Hey, that, um, that's an important part of the race. Well, listen, not. hard work is what you have to yeah, do. No, Raising no, the money no, is the no, easy no, part, no, man. Yeah, no, that's 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 something that it, that's something special. Okay, something special. I'm I'm super psyched about that. Like, I'm pumped wow. about it too. So we'll try wow. to help and do what we can. There's a lot of time, but I know that's that, uh, creative. Is is really creative, and uh, you know, it's like we do with my government class. We the kids have to do volunteering, and so in the past we've done like some soup kitchens, but like you know. It's recycling. We have the Hawksworth blood drive. We do other things, but 
yeah, I'd love to get some of my students involved with this this as well, and maybe we can go over and I want I want to get involved with this too. It's all awesome, grassroots man. level. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. So, um, yeah. all right, we'll all do right. that. Thank you, man. Hey, Appreciate I'm you, super brother. Pumped. It's great.